Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, May 4th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Mahomza, would you um, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety, without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's hybrid Board of Education meeting is being held both virtually and in person by board members and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live and BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the May 4th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I am unaware of any changes or additions to tonight's agenda. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction. or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals, and eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Oh, excuse me, I need to add closed session items nine and 15. The next item on the agenda is personal matters, and for that, I call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, leaves, certificated appointments. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Do I have a motion to approve the personal matters as presented through exhibits D1 through D4? So moved, Mac. Second, Offerman. Thank you. It was moved by Ms. Mack, and it sounds like it was seconded um, by Mr. Offerman. Is there any discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. 
Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm bringing uh, following the, I'm bringing to you the following administrative appointments for your approval. Principal of Wellwood International School, Principal of Pikesville High School, the Principal of Battle Monument School, the Principal of Shady Spring Elementary School, the Principal of Franklin High School, the Principal of Maiden Choice School, Assistant Principal at Arbutus Middle School, Coordinator in the School Counseling, Office of School Counseling, and Supervisor of Office of Health Services. Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Mac. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second, Ms. Pasteur. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joves? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our first recommended appointment is Ms. Kristen Alkire, principal of Wellwood International School. Currently, she's the assistant principal at Woodmont Middle School. Uh, she brings to us 17 years of experience in Baltimore County. She served as a stat teacher, resource teacher, mathematics teacher, and classroom teacher. Congratulations, Principal Alkire. The next appointment is Eric Eiswert, principal of Pikesville High School. Let me see. Currently, she's the assistant principal at Woodmont Middle School. Uh, she brings to us years. I'm sorry, could we please ask everybody to mute? I'm sorry, we're getting a, a great amount of feedback. If we could ask everyone to please, if you're on the phone or if you're in, if everybody could please mute. Thank you. The picture that you saw Thank earlier you. was of our newly appointed principal, Ms. Alkire. Next is Mr. Eric Eiswert, principal of Pikesville High School. He brings to us 24 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he was the assistant principal at Newtown High School. He served as assistant principal at Cadensville High School. He served as a social studies teacher, resource teacher. He was a sp part of our aspiring leader in 2004. Congratulations, Mr. Eiswert. Our next candidate is is Kyle Martin, principal of Battle Monument School. He brings to us 19 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he's the assistant principal at Deep Creek Elementary. He served at Riggs Ruxin School and Battle Monument. Uh, he also served as a special ed teacher at Stimmers Run Middle, Pikesville High, and again at Stim Stimmer Run Middle School. He had previous experience at Calvert Hall College High School. Congratulations. Mr. Martin. Our next candidate is Mr. Noonan, principal of Shady Spring Elementary School. He brings to us 12 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, he's the assistant principal at Shady Group, sorry, excuse me, Shady Spring Elementary School. He served as a classroom teacher at Pot Spring Elementary School. Congratulations, Mr. Noonan. Next, we have uh, we have Kieran O'Connell, or Mr. O. Uh, he's the assistant principal at Franklin High School. He's being appointed as the principal of Franklin High School. He has served as a physical education teacher at Franklin High School, Franklin Middle School, and Riverview Elementary. He brings to us 20 years of service in Baltimore County. Congratulations, Mr. O'Connell. Our next candidate. 
Monique Owens as the assistant principal at Arbutus Middle School. She brings to us 11 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the special ed inclusion teacher at Pikesville Middle. She served at, prior to that, at Southwest Academy, Catonsville Middle School, Deer Park Middle Magnet, and again at Deer Park Middle Magnet as an inclusion and self-contained teacher. Congratulations, Ms. Owens. Our next candidate is Matare Raymond, Coordinator, School Counseling, Office of School Counseling. She brings to us 15 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the specialist in the Office of School Counseling. Prior to that, she served as a school counselor at Towson High School and Perry Hall High School. She also served years in Baltimore City Public Schools at East Hartford Public Schools as well. Congratulations, Ms. Raymond. Our next candidate is Ms. Nicole Torbett, supervisor in the Office of Health Services. She brings to us seven years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she serves as a nurse in the Office of Health Services. She served as a nurse in Deep Creek Elementary School. She has had previous experience at St. Elizabeth School and Rehabilitation Center for five years. Congratulations, Ms. Torbett. And our last candidate is Catherine West, principal at Maiden Choice School. Currently, she serves as the assistant principal at Maiden Choice. She brings to us 27 years of experience in Baltimore County. She served as a special ed teacher at Franklin High, a mentor teacher at Catonsville High, Southwest Academy, and Windsor Mill Middle. She served as a special ed teacher of inclusion at Windsor Mill, special ed teacher at Pine Grove Middle, and a teacher of hearing impaired at Pine Grove Middle. Congratulations, Principal West. I would like to thank our staff in the Office of Human Resources under the leadership of Acting Chief Maria Lowry, our community superintendents, executive directors, and the Chief of School Climate and Safety for their work and their co collaboration for our efforts to fill these vacancies. It is typical that this is the springtime and early summer that we will see an increase of vacancies. Thank you, team, and congratulations to all of our administrative appointments. <laughs> Thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And again, congratulations to everyone. Um, I would just like to, again, ask that everybody who's on, either if you're on the phone or, or however you're on, please make sure that you're on mute because we are hearing some feedback. So. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. Members of the board, <clears throat> the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. Policy 1270, parent and family engagement. Policy 4004, evaluations. Policy 5470, services to students wellness. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit F. Do I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the Board's Policy Review Committee? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. If we could um, separate the policies, um, because I know that we received an email from a board member, um, but also I think it would be good to um, make comments okay. individually. Which co policy would you like separated? So there's only three. So if we could just. You would like to separately. separate all three policies? Is yes, that, please. Oh, okay. For discussion. Okay. So then the first one we can um, go in order to make sure um, to separate them out. And I know that we had, I believe, discussed this before. Do I need to make a motion for each one so that we can then. No. Okay. So then we can just separate them out to discuss. First is policy 1270, parent and family engagement. Are there any questions on that policy? Any discussion? Okay. Do I have a motion then to accept um, uh, policy 12, excuse me, 1270, parent and family engagement? So moved, Justin. So moved, Matt. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Hen. Thank you. Any Second discussion? Not needed if 
recommend it from the Oh, that's the right. Thank you for that, Mr. Offerman. Okay. So it has been moved. And um, was there any discussion? It looks like there's a comment from Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a question related to process. Um, typically, we have public comment, which includes public comment on the policies um, before we bring forward the new business item. So I just wondered if it would also be possible to um, comment for board members to comment after we hear public comment uh, in terms of um, if there's anything that we would want PRC to consider. So, um, Ms. Causey, if you look at board docs, the way the order is, and um, I believe this has been out for seven days, is where we have our policies first, and then public comment is afterwards. And public comment on those policies follows after that as well. So board members can make any comments or any questions they have um, actually right now. So... The policy 1270 okay. has been moved. So, Ms. Gover, could we take a roll call vote, please, on policy 1270? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next is policy 4004, evaluations. Any questions or comments from board members on that? Okay, hearing none. Um, do I have a motion to move, pol um, to move policy 4004, evaluations? So moved. So moved. Ms. 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 Thank you. Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And next is policy 5470, services <clears throat> to students wellness. Any questions? Looks like there was one from Dr. Hager. Yes, um, thank you. So um, many of you know that I, I do a lot of work around wellness policies, um, to both locally and nationally. So I was very excited to see that our wellness policy was up for, um, for revisions. And um, a lot has happened kind of in the federal policy landscape around wellness policy since this was last revised. Um, and in fact, in, prior to my time joining the board, um, I've done a lot of work with uh, school systems throughout the state, including Maryland, to um, help with uh, revising the wellness policy. And so I, I took some time to really kind of dig deep into the existing policy and, and ensuring that it um, really matches the expectations in the final rule that came out from the USDA. We've had four years since the final rule went into place to have a, a policy that matches all the new federal requirements. Um, and I really don't believe we're quite there yet, and I think we can we can do better. Um, I outlined a number of things specifically that I think should be improved in the policy um, in an email, and um, I could outline them publicly, or we could just um, request that they potentially goes back to the PRC uh, for additional revisions. Um, I'm, I, I defer to you, Ms. Scott, as the chair of the PRC, with how you would prefer to move forward. That's fine. If you sent over an email, you said, um to staff with some additions. So yes, we could um, send uh, policy 5470 back to the PRC to um, include um, those additions. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I sent it to the other board members as well. And and, and like I said, I, I'm happy to, to help in any way, um, both as a, you know, on both of my hats, if there's any way I can help um, to improve the wellness policy. So, Thank it. you. Do I have a motion to move policy 5470 back to the PRC committee? So, so moved, moved back. Second, second it sounded like it was moved by Miss Mack and seconded by Miss Hen.
Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Gilbert, may we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So um, our next item is public comment. <clears throat> this is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to call in by phone. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers were selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who register will be permitted to speak. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and the school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute limit and conclude remarks when time has expired and you hear the tone. The call will be ended and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. If I could ask everybody to please mute their, their phones, please. Thank you. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their names to the board and first to... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'll say that again because we were getting some feedback. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. So now the first speaker that we have, it looks like, is from our stakeholders. And I now call on our stakeholder group leaders to speak. Our first speaker is Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Ms. Sexton, you can go ahead. Okay, so next we have um, Mr. Tom DeHart from CASE. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. At the last board meeting, at your request, system leadership shared a plan for the reopening of schools for in-person instructions on a four-day schedule. All pre-K through five students would be eligible, as well as data-targeted secondary groups of students. The primary difference is the CDC metric, which allows three foot social distancing at the elementary level, but remains at six feet for secondary students. School leadership teams led by their principals have been hard at work since the morning following that meeting, using pertinent data and physical attributes of their schools to determine needs, identify students, reach out to them, and work with transportation to prepare for their return on May 10th or 17th. I had not planned on speaking tonight, but I've heard rumblings that some of the board may want to change this plan at the 11th hour and bring back any secondary student who wants to return across the system. I'm sure that there are board members whose constituents advocate for this, but let's review some facts. First, the social distancing requirement at the secondary level prevents you every student from not being broadcast school. yet. Excuse me, if we could, excuse me, Mr. DeHart, if we could ask for everyone, please, to mute their phones. 
I apologize, Mr. DeHart. Please go ahead. The six foot social distancing requirement at the secondary level prevents every student from returning at this point, which is the foundation of any plan. School leadership teams have used data and the board's own equity focus to identify specific targeted groups of students that would benefit the most from face-to-face -face instruction and spent every bit of the last two weeks planning for their return. Each school is different and decisions must be made based on data and physical limitations. Our schools are not cookie cutters, so numbers will vary from school to school. And site-based leadership under the direction of system leaders have used data and an equity lens to drive the number of students identified to return. This is what the leadership in buildings have been hired, trained, and paid to do. Both system and school-based leadership have worked diligently to respond to the request for full-time face-to-face instruction, but in simplest terms, there are CDC limitations which preclude a total return of every student at the secondary level. An arbitrary change to our reopening plan at this point would show a complete lack of respect and appreciation for the hard work students have done over the last two weeks. Is that the message you want to send? A motion from this board to return it any student who wants, no matter the metrics, is an example of the concern I shared with this board at the last meeting where I reviewed the difference between the board's role of governance versus the hired professional's job of operations. So I'll be very Stay in your lane. Isn't this what we ask of every employee? And as an aside, I find it distressingly ironic in that the members of this board would dictate full in-person return of all students, no matter the metrics, when there has not been a full in-person return of this board. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Charmaine Davis from the NAACP Reynoldstown. Good evening. Thank you. I am um, a new NBC News article just posted um, today emphasizing Biden's commitment to addressing uh, budget and policy gaps that aggregate inequality. And I believe to overcome this, we need accountability and transparency. So I guess my question relates to the, the newly formed budget committee. I know that the superintendent oversees the school budget, but I wanted to know the purpose or is there a charter available out outlining the purpose of this um, newly formed budget committee? Oh, thank you, Ms. Davis. Okay, uh, it looks like uh, next we have Ms. Julie miller breets from uh, GTCAC. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, board members, Dr. Williams, and the BCPS community. It's been some time since we've been able to address the board, and we want to first welcome Makita Scott in her historic chairwomanship. Congratulations. And second, share some of what we've been working on. At our February meeting, we were able to host Dr. Superintendent Dr. Williams, and we're thrilled with some great conversation around acceleration, twice exceptional students, and identification processes. The GTCAC had specific asks, developing a policy specific to acceleration, revising policy 5110 for early entry to pre-K and kindergarten to make it less restrictive and in better alignment with COMAR, using the Iowa, Iowa acceleration scale to determine the appropriateness of acceleration, using school system data to identify and screen potential candidates for acceleration, boosting the Head and Shoulders Math program, developing a Head and Shoulders ELA program, providing better identification training and responses to twice exceptional learners while also looking at district-wide data to better identify the scope of two e-learners within BCPS, considering earlier identification for GT programming while also disaggregating data to ensure equity in GT education in Baltimore County, and increasing visibility, publicizing, and communicating to stakeholders the processes, procedures, policies, and timelines related to gifted and talented education. Dr. Williams was very receptive to many of our suggestions and voiced a desire to develop a long-term plan, including both short and long-term goals, while also considering budgetary implications in order to map out what could be accomplished within the next two years. He would like for staff working with the GTCAC to come up with a plan of action that would incorporate thinking about training, the identification process, looking at school system data, collaboration between the Office of Advanced Academics and the Office of Special Education, and improving communication and access to information to better gifted and talented education. We stand ready to participate and are excited about this opportunity. At our April meeting, we hosted Dr. Carrie Gilbalt, assistant professor at Johns Hopkins and an expert on acceleration who shared with us this quote from another educator. 
quote, the research on acceleration is so uniformly positive, the benefits of acceleration so unequivocal that it is difficult to see how an educator could oppose it. We are hopeful that BCPS continues to actively look at acceleration policies and procedures in the district and think holistically about how to better identify and implement either subject level, grade level, or radical acceleration for those students who would benefit. Our next meeting will be tomorrow, May 5th at 7 p.m., and Wade Kearns, the coordinator of the Office of Advanced Academics, will be presenting the disaggregated data report related to gifted and talented education that was recently presented to the board in written form. We really hope to see you there. Thank you so much for your time. Good night. Thank you, Ms. Spreets. Uh, next, we have Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. <laughs> <clears throat> Ms. Sexton, Hello. if you're there. Yes, you can go ahead. Yes, thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Even though we are in the final quarter of the school year, things definitely are not slowing down for our educators. They continue to do all they can to manage their virtual students and their face-to-face -face ones. They have again had to find workarounds and options when the internet, Schoology, and other programs are not available. That they are able to do it speaks to their tenacity and dedication to our students. But there is a limit to what they can do, how many times they can shift, and how many workarounds one person is capable of figuring out. They are at that limit. During this week especially, Teacher Appreciation Week, we need to be sure that with our words and our actions, we are supporting our educators. And while that can look like many different things, right now, for the remainder of this school year, it needs to look like letting our educators teach our students. Not one more schedule change or additional duty or ask, because educators are doing all they can to continue to provide rigorous, authentic instruction for students. Please let them do that work. I know you are hearing from some parents who want you to change the schedule again for the remainder of this school year. I implore you not to do this. The plan is in place. Our students, families, educators, administrators, support staff, we all know the plan and it is working. Please don't ask any of us to pivot, shift, or find a way to change one more thing one more time. Let us finish out these last weeks of this most unusual and trying school year, working the plan we have, doing what we know our students need. Let us please look to next school year and put our planning and effort into making sure that everything is in place for us to welcome our students in August. On the agenda later is the report on community engagement and par partnerships. Of the five focus areas on that report, educators are an essential partner in every single one. Every year, but especially after this past year, our students will need us more than ever. This is the time to be sure educators have a seat at every table where plans are being discussed and decisions are being made. We know what our students need. We know what our communities need, and we have the connections to families. This work should not and cannot be done without us. And we stand at the ready because so much more is happening within our school system the expansion of community schools, the instructional plan for next year, and how to use the grant monies received from CARES 1, CARES 2, and the American Rescue Plan. These are just a few of the hottest topics. Let us have those conversations and make those decisions collaboratively. Please be sure that TAPCO is at the table from the beginning. Thank you again to all of our educators, especially during Teacher Appreciation Week, for all they do all the time. And thank you, Chairwoman Scott, for meeting with the TABCO Board of Directors last week. We would look forward to meeting with you again and continuing our conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sexton. And if I could remind everybody to mute, please, because we are still getting some feedback. Okay, thank you. So um, that is... Um, um, it for our stakeholders. So next we have a uh, general public comment and our first speaker is Emily Mulnix. Hi. Good evening, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this evening. My name is Emily Mullinix. I have two children in Baltimore County Public Schools in fifth and sixth grade. Both of my children struggled for different reasons when they were attending school in person, and both have thrived 
in the virtual setting. You have heard plenty from people who want to send students back to school buildings. <clears throat> they are not the only voices that matter. I'm here tonight to ask you to improve and expand upon the current virtual school model for next school year and beyond, not scale things back to the previous e-learning offering. Many students are thriving and many families still have health concerns. We are still in the midst of a pandemic after all. We deserve an equitable online option. My sixth graders struggled with communication throughout mm. elementary school. The chat box in Google Meet and messages in Schoology have allowed her to participate in class and advocate for herself without having to speak in front of her peers. It is easier for her to learn and she is less frustrated. This has been a better middle school experience than I ever expected for her. We have finally found the free and appropriate public education that we've been seeking for her since preschool. I implore you not to take that away from us. My fifth grader is recommended for advanced academic placement for sixth grade. He is also nervous about COVID and prefers attending class and completing schoolwork from home with less distractions. He is not eligible for a vaccine yet, and I don't know whether all of his classes will be offered online. How do you expect us to make this choice? This year has clearly shown us that one size does not fit all in education and virtual school can work well if implemented correctly. I know from my conversations with other parents and with educators that many students could continue to benefit from virtual learning if given the option. There's no good reason to go backwards. Please consider extending virtual learning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Molnix, next we have Ms. Megan Hughes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Great, thanks. My name is Megan Hughes, parent of three BCPS students. I continue to be concerned about the loss of learning this year. Many of us have already discussed our concerns with virtual learning, such as the increased absence and disengagement of students. However, tonight I want to discuss the actual loss of learning hours and the lack of challenge in the classroom this past year. I mentioned two weeks ago that middle schools, it was reported to the MSBE that they received on average 24.3 hours per week of instruction, when they were in fact only receiving 14 hours of synchronous instruction at the time of reporting. Since we have entered into the hybrid learning model, the hours have increased to 21 hours. Six hours a day, four days a week. However, three of those hours are advisory and non-graded course. In a typical year, they would receive 30 instructional hours per week. When you subtract out the advisory, it's 28.6 hours. So ultimately, for middle school students, there was a 51% reduction in instructional hours for the first two quarters up until hybrid began. And from there until the end of the school year, there is still a 27% loss of instructional hours compared to a normal year. What have they missed and what is the plan to recover those losses? In addition, virtual learning has given the parents more insight into what happens in the classroom. My son happened to come down for a snack during his sixth grade GT ELA class, so I overheard as they spent a large proportion of one of his classes listening to an audiobook that was followed by an assessment to make sure they paid attention. I know this isn't just a Baltimore County thing because my older daughter also listened to audiobooks when we lived in New York. I just want to know when did we stop having students read on their own and use class time to analyze what they read? This led to a discussion from other parents about what their children are learning as we begin to reminisce about the days of spelling, vocabulary, and grammar. Who doesn't remember sentence diagramming with the subject, verb, indirect, and direct object? None of my children know what that is. One friend decided to quiz her middle school children at the dinner table and asked if they knew what a noun and a verb was. And to her and my surprise, they could not answer that question. Maybe they just forgot from elementary school. And I will say that my second grader overheard the conversation and started singing a little song she learned in school this year. A verb is a word is an action word. So I was happy to know that my seven-year-old knew what a verb was. Also, I'm sure how virtual learning and lessened hours for instruction has possibly drastically changed curriculum this year. As parents, we want to know that our children are being exposed to a vigorous education that will challenge them and stretch their minds. It's not about overwhelming the students, but the brain is a muscle just like the bicep, and it must be tested and stressed so growth occurs. Also, we know that many parents have shared that their children are moving to private schools, and after testing, these children have been placed a year behind where they were at Baltimore County Schools. Is that due just to this year with the virtual learning, or is our entire curriculum behind? The bottom line is that as parents, we want to make sure our children are receiving the education they need to be able to pursue higher education and their career as adults. We are looking forward to five days of school in the fall, but we need the option of four days in school for all kids this year. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. Next, we have Miss Jen Burton. Hello. Hello, I am Jen Burton, a mother of two boys at Baltimore County Public Schools. First, I would like to thank all the teachers listening for your time, willingness to be flexible, and your efforts this school year. Next, I would like to thank the board for communicating that schools will be open for five days for all with an option for virtual for those who want it in the fall. Communication is a key part of a relationship, and I feel the lack of communication with teachers, parents, and students has failed us over the last year and a half. Therefore, it has put a major division in the relationship with administration, teachers, parents, and students. With no communication comes lack of consistency among schools. For example, some schools are not allowed to use the playground. All schools should allow students access to the playground equipment. Another example is plexiglass around students' desks. Not all schools have it, and it is unnecessary. I am asking for better communication, transparency, and honesty with teachers, parents, and students in order to rebuild the relationship starting now. Next, I would like to ask why. Why can't middle and high school students have the same opportunity as elementary school students and return back to school four days a week now? They need to be back in the school building. There is no reason they cannot go back to school this school year. It is detrimental to our students' education, mental health, and overall well-being. The gap between our students and private schools is only getting larger. The time is now. Another question I have is since Governor Hogan lifted the outdoor mask mandate, why can't our students play outdoors with no masks? Why can't they have PE outside with no masks? Most kids are outside playing sports multiple times a week together mask-free. Now is the time to allow our allow outdoor mask breaks. <coughs> Lastly, I would like to talk about TABCO and the teacher's demands. In short, the five demands they have are reliable internet, separate teachers for virtual and in-person students, compensation for the 100 minutes of planning they lost, rescinding the excess staff, and transparency on the data breach. These are not high demands. Our children are being used as political pawns and are being hurt by the board's careless actions. I have heard rumors that Baltimore County Public Schools has paid off the ransomware of over $3 million. I don't understand why you can meet their demands, but not our teachers that are supporting our children every single day. As a parent who volunteers a ton with time and money and supports our teachers 100% because it benefits my own children, it breaks my heart seeing them stay in the parking lot waiting to walk in with my students. It is causing unnecessary division between administration, teachers, parents, and even students. It causes lack of communication and more stress on them and our students. Our kids need more help and attention now more than ever, not less. Please fix this as soon as possible. The time is now. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me, a mom, a taxpayer, a Baltimore County public school stakeholder, and a member of the Baltimore County Parent Coalition. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Erica Ma. Ms. Erica Ma, are you there? Hello? Yes, is this Ms. Ma? Yes. I'm yes. sorry. Am I, I, I thought I unmuted, but you guys unmuted me. Okay, you can hear me now? We can. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you. My name is Erica Ma, and I'm a parent and teacher in BCPS. From the beginning of this year, communication has been an issue. There was a lack of communication about ransomware and our paycheck status. And while the News Hub has recently had more updates, there's still dozens of employees waiting for communication about certifications, reimbursements, back pay, or even getting their newborns onto their insurance. Communication on vaccines was extremely frustrating, in particular when BCPS knew how important it was to teachers to feel safe in schools. We got communication to sign up for vaccines in January, and a clinic was held for pre-K and K, and then silence. Nothing until the Tim Tutin report about our low rate of vaccinations. Suddenly, teachers were inundated with vaccine emails from BCPS. It seems that the news media putting us under a microscope was more important than teacher concerns about safety. A few weeks ago, BCPS communicated with us that we had intermittent outages on two days when we were totally shut out of school internet. Totally shut out. These were not intermittent. That communication was made even more ridiculous by the claim that it was shut down at 8.15 because of too many Google Meet cameras on. 815, during which our high schoolers are logged on. And anyone who knows teach knows or teaches a high schooler knows that their cameras are never on. BCPS did not upgrade the system sufficiently. Please do not blame our high schoolers or hint that perhaps teachers need more PD. And then your communication about how to handle virtual students should there be more internet issues. That was sent on a Friday night at 7 p.m., telling us that teachers should prepare two sets of lessons before Monday. 
We all know that teachers are working on Sundays, but that was just another poorly thought out piece of communication. Then two weeks ago, this communication was that there were only 10 minutes of internet outages on Thursday. But I know of at least 30 first graders who did not have class all day because their teachers could not use their internet in school. We know that nearly everyone has Schoology problems, not BCPS's fault, but the bottom line was that students could not learn on our system and teachers could not teach. And I'm still waiting as a teacher to hear about the five days in person in the fall. Happy Teacher Appreciation Day to us. Like our internet outages that were intermittent, I'm also not giving you the whole story when I tell you I'm here to talk about communication. I'm really here to talk to you about faith and trust. And the fact that your continued partial truths and omissions have caused a loss of faith and trust. You have lost the trust of teachers and the faith of families that you are doing your best for our students and our children. This is not a trust and faith that we want to lose. In fact, many of us have fought to keep it, but we are tired and we are disillusioned. And many of us only have trust in ourselves and our fellow teachers and faith in our students left. You have the power to bring that faith and trust back. Can you do it? And will you? Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Jen Reedholm. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Hello, and thank you. My name is Jen Reedholm, and I'm a member of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition, Inc., and a parent of three Baltimore County students. First, I'd like to say thank you for finally including mainstream IEP and 504 students in the latest reopening plan. This is the first time these students have been included, and I surely hope lessons have been learned and these students are not left in the bottom in the future. I am concerned about the privacy as they will now be easily identified on May 17th by their peers. To my understanding, other targeted students are also being brought back to essentially camouflage these students, but their privacy is also in jeopardy because targeted sounds like failing. Whether or not that's the intent, that's the perception. The best remedy for the privacy concerns is to have all students return on May 10th for four days a week in-person instruction regardless of their situation, circumstance, or any other reason. Many larger school systems around the country who have, had, who have had or have much higher COVID statistics than BCPS have successfully returned students five days a week and have been doing so since August prior to a vaccine with little to no cases to date. All, all students should be given a choice to fully return as COVID numbers are rapidly decreasing. All up-to-date research supports full return for schools, and this is completely feasible by Monday. With just under two months left, it would still be highly beneficial for students to come back full time to finish out the remainder of the school year with their classmates and finally get off the computers. Transportation's in place, three foot uh, social distancing is acceptable and masks are no longer required outdoors. It seems CCPS only uses the CDC guidelines, which is not mandates by the way, if it stifles kids from returning to buildings. However, when the CDC loosens guidelines like not wearing masks outdoors, BCPS does not follow those. You can't have it both ways. Finally, I would like to address the virtual learning option for the fall. How are parents supposed to choose that as an option when there's literally no information about the program and no data to support it? Well, I must make it clear that I'm not against the virtual option and I agree with choice for those who it works for. There needs to be data to support it. I'm constantly being told that data is required for my child to receive services for dyslexia. This is the same thing. Where's the data to support the virtual option? I hear students are thriving, but what does that actually mean? Does it mean getting A's and B's? Or does it actually mean receiving an education? Unfortunately, the virtual curriculums have not been the best. Our schools have fallen to the bottom in the country. Many high schools have fallen significantly within our own state compared to the other high schools across the state. For example, Delaney used to be number five, and now they're number 58 in less than 10 years. Towson has also slipped from number nine to now number 50. This slippage, slippage happened under virtual learning, so I'd like to see the data that actually supports virtual learning so parents can be best informed and make the best choice for their child. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Diana Bergman. Greetings, Madam Chair Makita Scott and Superintendent Dr. Williams. Today, 
I would like to share as a witness on the record concerning concerns regarding some members of the board who continue to show a disturbing misunderstanding of their responsibilities and duties of public service as board members. Recently, BCPS announced fully reopening plans for in-person instruction and virtual learning for the upcoming fall school year. Parents, please complete the survey if you would like your child to continue virtual instruction before the deadline. We shouldn't have a deadline. Now, why should our choices be limited? Let me be clear. The reopening agenda item has sucked the air out of all other important educational topics. It has been time-consuming, exhausting, and dysfunctional. The most misleading agenda item on the record in the history of BCPS board meetings. Don't celebrate just yet. That's not an accomplishment. Teachers, students, and parents have been open 24-7 to education all school year. Tonight, I believe one board member, with the support of those AKA Sneaky Five, will once again focus on a potential of office misconduct when using their authority to override protocols in order to protect their own personal agenda, using the teachers for their own personal privilege. Last month, the original first budget committee meeting that was open to the public was canceled in short notice because according to witnesses the committee chair was spotted having dinner at a fancy restaurant versus doing their due diligence to serve on the board and committee let it be on the public record that one board member does not decide the responsibility of the other board members committee Madam chair, chair to actually do their due diligence inappropriately to serve. I still haven't forgotten the day BCPS teachers testify on the operating budget to Point stay up listening for two hours of debate on how to end a public workshop meeting with the first motion of action was to end the meeting. It was extremely inconsiderate and disrespectful to our teachers who simply took the time to share the needs to better educate our BCPS students. So for those board members who continue to be Madam so Chair, extra point of and order. still out point of touch, excuse me, do not excuse interrupt. me. I am speaking. I have the floor. An inappropriate person. I excuse me. Hold up. Point of order. Point of order. Excuse me. If I could, if you could stop, if I could, in, if if I could interject, please. Um, we want to stay away from um, speaking about individuals or speaking. Um, uh, about anyone, but also we don't want to inter interrupt our, our public. So I believe there were 15 seconds. Oh, she's done? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I would just say to everyone, to our, um, to all of our speakers, to not speak about um, individuals as a, a rule state, um, but to keep our comments um, general and professional. So next we have Ms. Janelle Austin. Hello, good evening, how are you? Well, Good thank you. How Please you? go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, my name is Janelle Austin, and I'm here to speak to you about time. Time is a small word, but it is very valuable. Time is often something we want more of, but somehow there is never enough. Even when we write out our to-do list, schedule our days, nights, and weekends, we often find that we are out of time. Likewise, our BCPS teachers face the same challenges each day as they set out to plan instruction. There simply isn't enough time to plan the lessons that are engaging, that offer learners student choice, provide scaffolding for various ability levels, provide differentiation, and are culturally relevant, responsive, and reflective. We also need to plan lessons that meet the needs of students with the IEPs and students who are English language learners. These lessons are to be equitable, innovative, cohesive, experiential, authentic, inclusive, integrated, data-driven, research-based, based on best practices, developmentally appropriate, involving multiple modalities. But this is what BCPS educators do. Our, time, our planning time is valuable. I will share with you just one story. There is a childhood educator who works in special education. She plans lessons and creates materials specifically to meet the needs of her students because the standard curriculum materials do not address their needs. She collaborates with classroom teachers, compiles and analyzes data, completes testing and draft reports. She communicates with 25 to 30 families in multiple grades, in multiple cohorts, and multiple teachers. This work cannot be done in exactly 250 minutes of planning. My reason for telling you her story and of my colleagues is to make sure that you are aware planning time is not just the time it takes to go to the copy machine and make 28 copies of the workbook pages. 
Planning time is creating lessons that meet the needs of our diverse learners. Part of that planning time is communicating with students, families, and each other about our students that we may share to ensure we are addressing the total students and their needs, not just academic, but their social needs, their emotional needs, and their physical needs when we can. Planning is the time we spend researching best practices, researching technology that will enhance the learner's experience. Planning is finding ways to reach one more student to ensure that he or her meets academic success. Planning is analyzing data, adjusting the instruction to move students from where they are to where they need to be. Planning is creating engaging lessons that do offer student choice, provide scaffolding and differentiation. Planning is lessons, planning involves lessons that are culturally relevant, responsive, and reflective. We want to again ask VCBS to not just think of planning as copying worksheets so that when teachers ask to be reimbursed for their 100 minutes of lost planning time, Please know, this is a small act. We have given more substantial, and we have given more substantial than what we are asking for. 100 minutes of unpaid time is a minimal that we have given. We are not asking Thank for you. for every minute. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Eileen. Madam Chair, Ro point of excuse order. Me. My name is Diana Bergman. Oh, no, excuse me, Ms. Bergman. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Ms. Bergman, uh -huh. your time was up, was, so we, we were going in order. We thank you, but your your time is um, um, was in it, Ms. Bergman. I have seconds left on the time. No, I apologize, Ms. Bergman. No, your time um, okay. was, was expired, so we're um, going on to make sure that we get general um, public comment from everyone. Um, so okay. thank you. Next is Ms. Eileen Turong. Next is, um, I'm sorry, we're Ms., um, we'll come back to Ms. Eileen too wrong. Next we have Ms. Amy Adams. Good Ms. evening. Can oh. you hear me okay? We can now. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yes. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and board members. I was pleased to receive the communications about returning to five days of in-person instruction starting in the fall and the offering of a virtual option. I was surprised that the announcement was made at 5 p.m. the day before a board meeting. Many families have a lot of questions regarding this plan, and I hope more details will be discussed tonight. I also want to thank the majority of the board members who voted to keep the reopening discussion as a standing agenda item because clearly schools won't be fully reopened until the fall. First this evening, I would like to request that all board members and any staff member who is speaking be visible on screen during the entirety of the board meeting. I would like to also see the public commenters. I would happily come in person to give my statement. It's very disengaging to stare at a slide while discussions are occurring and not knowing who is speaking. Second, during the April 20th meeting, members were limited to one reopen question, each with additional each with additional questions to be emailed to staff and answers will be made to the public. Where can we find the remaining member questions and published answers? I would like BCPS to update their policy to follow the state and the county directives and allow children to remove their masks while playing at recess outdoors, while participating in PE class outdoors, or while practicing or competing in sports outdoors. I would like further explanation behind the policy reported during the last reopen discussion about the playground equipment must be cleaned daily. There's a wealth of infectious disease studies to show that contact transmission is not a risk at schools and cleaning playgrounds once a day is a waste of resources and manpower. I have heard that some principals or librarians are the ones cleaning the equipment just to be compliant with the policy so that children can use it during recess. Baltimore County playgrounds have been open for months and are not regularly cleaned. Please update your policy. I would like to hear during the reopen discussion a report on COVID-19 transmission in our schools. The BCPS COVID dashboard has not been updated since April 23rd. There have been rumors of outbreaks at schools, but I cannot find the data to support these rumors on the school or state website. Lastly, and most important, I'll say it again. Last and most important, will any of you motion this evening to bring back all secondary students in cohort A and B four days a week starting Monday, May 10th? The metrics indisputably support this. Baltimore County has been under 5% since April 27th. Further, the cases per 100,000 have been decreasing since April 14th and are now under 20. By May 10th, Baltimore County will likely be in the lesser of three levels of community transmission, the blue, yellow, or orange. In any of these categories, the CDC recommends three feet of social distancing for secondary students. Let's get all of these kids who would choose it back in school. Please note, this would just be 23 in-person days if we start next Monday. We've had more than a year to prepare. 
please, no more reasons why this isn't logistically possible. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Sharon Seroff. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Good evening, Board President Scott, Superintendent Williams, and distinguished board members. My name is Sharon Seroff. You all know who I am and have heard me speak many times. I am here tonight to speak about virtual learning in regards to special education. I know that many of you have heard the cries to open five days a week for many parents of special needs students. I wonder how many of you have noticed there are an equal amount of parents with special needs students who are doing as well, if not better, on the virtual platform. Yes, you heard me correctly. Despite the lack of in-person learning and computer difficulties, many students with special needs have found more success on the virtual platform. Students have found it easier to talk to teachers and service providers through chat feature on Google Meet. Students have found it easier to interact with teachers and non-disabled classmates because of lack of distractions and lessening of social anxiety. Some students with physical disabilities are able to access their classes because virtual learning has eliminated physical barriers. The list goes on. These parents would like this success to continue. If there is a positive takeaway from this school year, it is that one size does not fit all. That is actually a part of special education. The I in IEP stands for individualized. We know next year schools will be open five days in person. BCPS says they plan to offer a virtual option. The survey provided to some parents and the BCPS website hints at a plan to go back to e-learning, which you have offered students for years. If BCPS is not planning to improve and expand the e-learning to include K-12 grade levels, advanced academics, special education, and related services, BCPS is not listening to its parents and students who are meeting success through virtual learning. The free and appropriate public education that we have finally found for our children will not be available moving forward. Instead of just providing confusingly worded surveys that give you limited information, show us your willingness to improve and expand virtual learning options. How about having a virtual town hall? This time, listen to and act on our suggestions. Why not put virtual learning on your agenda and have a meaningful conversation with parents. Don't go back to the status quo. Show us you are willing to work with us and continue to provide a virtual learning option for these special needs who have found success. Other states have been able to provide successful virtual learning. Thank you, Ms. Seroff. CPS can too, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Seraph. And next we have um, Ms. Eileen Chirong. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Good evening. As the great superintendent, Dr. William, has said, everything we do is for and about the children and we put them first. My name is Eileen Chung, representing myself as a parent with two children in PCPS and longtime Baltimore County resident. I do not belong to any group or organization. Recently, MSDA, MSDE has announced that school district will have to offer full-time in-person learning next school year. My daughter has not been allowed to enter the school building since March 2020. She has expressed to her teacher and us that she cannot breathe with a mask on and sweat easily under the mask after only a few minutes. I brought up the concern and was advised by school health experts that I should train my daughter until she could get used to it. Instantly, with some logic thinking, I didn't think this was a responsible approach to this situation on an eight-year-old child. And if I was to do this to my baby prior to COVID, child protective service would be at my front door. So we have no option but stay in virtual learning. I was informed that all measures are to protect the students, but mostly staff. Although studies have shown children are at the lowest risk with this virus compared to all things such as the flu, vehicle accidents, etc., 
And that's the science behind the mask, is to block in the droplets of the infected, but not protecting the wearers. I've also been told that the school only followed these safety guidelines by the health department and the CDC. According to the guidelines, masks must be handled properly. One must always wear handle a mask with gloves or no clean hands. Never wear a mask room to room and should not constantly touch the front of the mask because it increases the spread of virus. We had none of this. We can wear what we want, any material. Oftentimes with the same mask all day, then just throw it on the ground and put it in your packet or cup holder. Wear it in a place where people then take it off. Everyone has been seen doing all of the above. Such a danger is also present here. For children are not only in danger in their mental, physical, and psychological well-being by the obligation to wear face masks all day during school or physical activities and to keep their distance from each other and from other persons, but they have already been harmed. At the same time, there is a violation of numerous rights of the children and their parents under the law and constitution. I was completely horrified when I drove past a field where I saw little children were training with masks on under hot 80 plus degree weather, according to the WHO. Quote, children should not wear masks when playing sports or doing physical activities such as running, jumping, and playing on the playground, so that it doesn't compromise their breathing. Therefore, forcing masks on kids is unsafe, and it's not intellectual honest by anyone who claims that a piece of cloth can stop one of the most contagious Thank viruses. Thank you. Let's unmask the kids. Thank you. And children mask mandate. Excuse Thank that's you. time. Thank you, Ms. Strong. And um, next, Ms. Okay. Yeah, now, I would remind if everybody could mute their phones until um, it's time to talk. So our next um, public comment is on policies. And for that, um, Ms. Julie Hen will be presiding over the first part of um, the policies, uh, public comment on our policies. And the first is uh, policy 1270, parent and family engagement. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Ms. Gover, do we have public speakers on policy 1270? Ms. Hen, I just sent you an email. Thank you. Okay, our first policy, 1270, community relations, community involvement, parent and family engagement. Our first speaker is Mary Taylor. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Thank you for thank you for allowing me to speak this evening. I'm going to speak about policy 1270, community involvement. It states that the Baltimore County Board of Education recognizes that it must collaborate with parents and guardians, families to support academic achievement. Furthermore, it states that the board values and promotes the engagement of all partners in providing the sustainable system of support for the academic and personal success of all students. The key word is engagement. It looks wonderful on paper, but how is the policy practiced in real life? I see that during Agenda O, there will be a presentation on community engagement and partnership. Maybe further discussion on focus area one, learning accountability and results, will be clearer details about the discrepancy in actual synchronous hours versus what was reported to the State of Board of Education being 24.5 hour week and the impact on achievement outcomes. Focus area four is community engagement and partnerships. Initiative three, stakeholder survey metrics. Has any of the surveys ever been made public? What's the point of a survey and gathering data if you aren't going to take the information and use it to better the system and make decisions? Public education is a partnership. The responsibility to educate a child lies within the parent. As legal guardians, we have duty to protect, care for, and educate our children. And while you allow teachers, unions, senior staff, advisories, and advocacy groups a seat at the table to feast on the meat and potatoes of our child's future, you seem to ignore many of us or sit us at the kids' table because you think it's all we can or should handle. Well, the system is wrong. And if you clearly follow and practice policy 1270, we would all have a seat at that table 
not just those you choose to communicate and engage with because they align with your agenda. If this policy is implemented as it is designed to do, we would fully support the implementation of this policy to strengthen communication and equitable community engagement. Thank you. My name is Mary Taylor. I'm the vice president of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition. Thank you for your time this evening. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. And may I remind um, those calling in to please mute your phones and mute your computers if you are listening in on your computer. We're getting a lot of background noise. Thank you. Our ne next speaker on Policy 1270 is Ms. Sharon Saroff. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, I'm going to echo some of what the previous speaker said. My name is Sharon Saroff, and I have been a parent and an advocate in the Baltimore County Public Schools for the past 18 years. And I don't have a seat at the table. I've never really had a seat at the table. And if you're going to implement a policy that says that parents and teachers and students and stakeholders should have a seat at the table and eat collaborative, you have to practice what you're preaching. I have not seen this type of a policy. I have not seen this kind of an attitude at BCPS for quite a long time. And I think that we have to start practicing what we preach. We also have to recognize that we have varying points of view and to allow all points of view in a professional manner to be provided and not play politics. That is something that I've seen way too much of recently, and I think that it needs to stop. Communication is important, and communication has been sorely lacking in the Baltimore County Public Schools in 18 years of being here. Collaboration is important, and again, that's been seriously lacking. Implement what your policy says and invite people to the table who have and are willing to provide you with meaningful input and engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. Our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Farron. Good evening, Dr. Farron. Good evening to all. Uh, policy 1270 talks about engagement and collaboration. However, it does not meet the needs of the students or families for three reasons. One reason is the board already voted today on the policies before the public speak. So, you know, why do, why do we care really to, to speak on the policy if the board already approved it? Two, public speakers are selected out of public sight. And it punishes people like myself and others who come early and to contribute in a meaningful way. And number three, the school system still have stereotype and defamation of religious groups, ethnicities, and that is really evident in the math curriculum in March of this year showing three hijabi students and linking them to radicalism just because of their Muslim faith. When you see one roach, there are a hundred roaches. And obviously the policy is not really being implemented. It's nice talk, but it's not implemented and it is not serving the public. So with that, I respectfully request that the superintendent and the Board of Education would direct the school administration to implement the policy in a meaningful way. And in relation to the hijabi girls labeled as radicals, I request that the school system will examine all the curriculum for any stereotype against color, national origin, faith, sexual orientation. We really owe it to our school and our generations growing 
that we implement the words that we are using in this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Farron. And I believe Madam Chair Scott is back. Ms. Scott, would you like me to turn it back over to you? Yes, thank you so very much, Ms. Hen. I appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you. It looks like our next speaker is um, Mr. Maha Jamil. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Peace and blessings, Madam Chair, Ms. Scott, Superintendent Dr. Williams, members of the board, and all participants in this meeting. The very first statement of the policy 1270 emphasizes that BCPS and community must collaborate to support academic achievement, ensuring that every student is prepared for college and or career opportunities. The second statement requires provision of sustainable system of support for the personal success of all students. In simple words, BCPS, in collaboration with parents and community, assure a high level of education to prepare the students for their future as successful, productive human beings. Such endeavor depends upon the high quality of teachers, counselors, and a well-planned futuristic curriculum, which require regular updating with the changing of the times. The experience of the last two decades has shown some deficiencies in the performance of both the curriculum and calendar committees, which needed to be pointed out by the insistence of some active community members who were not members of the area designated advisory committees. I thank the board for having taken the appropriate actions in those two committees. It is suggested that our superintendent, Dr. Williams, appoint new members in the advisory committees more frequently from the community at large. Community members should also be involved and appointed in other committees, such as curriculum, calendar, equity, legislative, government relations, etc. I had mentioned in my previous statement that our multicultural student population needs a director of diversity, just as our county executive has done so in the Baltimore County Police Department. Therefore, a diversity advisor committee be established. The community members of this committee should be representative of various ethnic, racial, and religious backgrounds. These proposed suggestions will assist BCPS in achieving its mission statement of this policy 1270. Thank you for listening. God bless you all and be safe. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Diana Bergman. Good evening. Um, I'm here to testify on policy 1270, and I have some concerns to share regarding this policy. I do like seeing the new language added to include caregivers and um, community members. What I have concerns about is, as earlier examples from earlier today, is how this current policy, people don't seem to be on page on what parent engagement is with BCPS, you know, being interrupted, being deleted and having comments and feedback ignored is not really positive or proactive for community relationships and community involvement. There is no process regarding this policy. There's no process in the superintendent rules either on how to address when the board members or BCPS fails to do their due diligence and actually have meaningful communication and engagement with parents and family in BCPS. Sometimes we're going to tell you stuff that you don't like, but there are issues that we want to address and find solutions to. That doesn't mean that you interrupt. It doesn't mean that you delete and pretend and put it away somewhere like it didn't happen. It's being brought up to the table in the forefront of it so it could be addressed and improved, so we could find solutions. And some of those topics might be really hard to handle, 
But you know what? Grown-up people, they figure out how to work together and get things done, especially when it comes to our students, our teachers, and our public education. So my recommendation for this policy is to find a way that we do our due diligence and we don't exclude anybody in the school, public school education community, because a lot of that has been happening. A lot of that has been happening, and we've been able to see it, witnesses, and it's on the record ongoing, and it needs to stop. So thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Carol Vidal. Hi, hi, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Scott, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education. My name is Carol Vidal, and I have two children in BCPS. And I just wanted to echo much of what the other commenters have already mentioned. The policy recognizes, values, and promotes the engagement that BCPS parents, caregivers, families, and communities must collaborate to support academic achieve achievement, ensuring that every student is prepared for academic and personal success. This policy has had many revisions over the years, and it has shown to be insufficiently specific this year, um, mostly. This year, the board and the superintendent's office has shown lack of flexibility for groups of parents outside of the traditional PTAs to be able to engage and communicate. Engagement of families in our children's education requires more space for parents for active and real involvement in all district areas. The policy should include more specific directives on improvement and communication between the board and the parents. Simply reforming or attempting to reform the way that the, the Board of Education meetings are uh, conducted would be a great step. The format of the board meetings is backwards and separates parents from the board. Any of the surrounding county uh, districts um, have had board meetings with good quality videos, no cameras turned off during the meetings, and with public comment on with video submissions, and now some of them are doing in-person board meetings. BCPS is supposed to be an advanced system that has invested too much on technology to not be able to conduct public comment for months during the winter or show board members as black boxes with initials throughout the year. Many parents have felt ignored and silenced during the pandemic, and while they watched their children's education and mental health window, they made efforts to be heard that were largely ignored by board members and office staff who do not respond to emails and stakeholders whose first concern are not the students. It is important and valuable to give an equal voice to parents. The system can choose what input it considers relevant, but it should at least consider opening up a seat at the table for those parents who want equal representation as other stakeholders. When parents um, have attempted to engage, they don't uh, always feel like the engagement is reciprocated. And an example is when um, parents have um, been involved in raising funds for their children's graduation celebrations, and now they're not sure whether the children will be able to celebrate within the system. This is the reason why giving a stakeholder privilege to groups of organized parents can go a long way in ensuring a voice for everyone. I believe the policy should include language on who the stakeholders are and allow the parent representation in the group of stakeholders. And finally, with all due respect, another example for engagement by the board with the community is ignoring public comment and voting for a policy that has not yet been commented on by the public. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jen Reed Holm. Hello. Yes, Ms. Reed Holm, you can go ahead. Thank you. I'm speaking on the community relations policy today because I have a lot of questions about how the policy is implemented. And if the school board has a pol this policy in mind when receiving communications from parents and community members, part of the policy states that families and community members are partners in providing a sustainable system of support for the academic and personal success of all students. I'm curious how families, in particular parents of students, can actually be recognized as partners with our school system. I asked a few meetings ago if the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition could be recognized as a stakeholder. This is a legal non-stock corporation filled with involved parents, students, and some teachers, all of who have a vested interest in having a better school system for all, but, a sense, but especially for our school students. A motion was made, but it did not pass because some board members we're not willing to recognize parents as a stakeholder that e that evening or any time before that, for that matter, for at least a year during the pandemic. Parents know their children best. Parents should be part of the discussion for issues that have major implications. During this entire school year, parents have not been allowed a seat at the table for any reopening plans, even though they are, are literally the top of the organizational chart. Furthermore, I feel parents have been blocked from communicating with certain board members. Only certain board members respond to communication from parents. Excuse me, most of the um, time that's not, not on the, the, the policy, um, um, ma'am. We need to stick to the policy 1270. Thank yes, you. Yes, it's about community relations. 
So furthermore, the board meetings have been such a struggle this year in general. Why can't you turn the cameras on or if you're virtual, why can't the boardroom be shown while public speakers are speaking and along uh, side of the board members who are virtual? Why don't we why do we have to see the Windows menu bar on the bottom of the screen, which covers up the faces of those who actually turn their cameras on? Why can't we have a way that the community members who speak on the camera instead of calling in? Other counties around us have figured out solutions to all these questions. It's not that hard to do. I would also like to know why comments emailed in that are requested for publication are no longer allowed to be part of the meeting minutes. Excuse this me, ma'am, this, is not, this is not policy 1270. Mr. Mercedes, could you please um, weigh in on, on this, please, so that callers can be um, clear on um, speaking on the policy and then speaking on other issues, because that's not related to the policy. Um, Mr. Mercedes, are you there? Absolutely. I'm trying to get to my point if I wasn't interrupted. Mr. Mercedes, could you please um, um, come in and speak on... Yes. Thank you. Hello, hello, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, the public commenters should confi confine their comments to the uh, subject of policy 1270. This is community relations, correct? It's parent and family hello? engagement. Yes, policy 1270. Right. It's policy. It's parent and family engagement. So, um, Please continue. And at the top of the policy, it says community relations, community involvement. So I'm trying to address that. Go ahead. If I may finish, I only have one paragraph to go. Please continue. Thank you. I would also like to know why comments emailed that are requested for publication are no longer allowed to be part of the meeting minutes. To me, this is stonewalling tactics to continue to silence parents. When and why and how is this process allowed to be changed? I have to ask, I've asked, and of course, to no surprise, I did not receive a courtesy of a response. Much of this year has been about stonewalling parents with the exception of a few board members who actually listen. Something is very wrong with all this and I encourage each and every one of you to take the community relations policy seriously and actually act on it. Parents are at the top of the organizational chart for BCPS and you need to find a way to work together to bring parents to the forefront. I would love to see some town hall sessions be scheduled in the near future with each individual board member because I honestly believe some members of the school board have no idea what their constituents desire or need from BCPS. And finally, I think this policy needs further review to put in actual guidelines when communicating Thank you. with parents and other people. That's time. Next, we have. Um, and that's just held excuse me. Thank you. That's time. Excuse me. Response. Thank you. That's time. Um, next, we have reviewed policy 1270. Next is board policy 4004. Personal personnel evaluations and again I would remind speakers to stick to the policy that um, we are uh, that is being discussed and our first speaker is Sharon Seraph. I don't have very much to say concerning this policy because I looked online several times and I was not able to find any detail on what this policy is all about or how it is implemented. So I can only go on what I see and have experienced in 18 years of having engagement with this county. And I don't feel that the policy that you have is being followed because teachers and, and do not get to have the same kind of consideration that they should um, and that administrators get to play favorites or um, weed out people that they just don't want to deal with anymore. Um, I think that if we're going to be saying something on a policy, that the details should be made available to those speakers so that we can give you meaningful comments and not have to do something on the fly from what we've experienced. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Bash Farone. Um, thank you. Policy 404 about general and personnel, in my opinion, is vague. The teacher's job performance is evaluated annually. 
However, the policy is missing the standard and the benchmarks by which the teacher is evaluated against. This is in line 22. Now, on line 20, the policy talks about collective bargaining units, etc. This gives the impression and the signal to the reader that the school system is so much focused on the comfort and the pay of the bargaining units and not on the welfare of the students. Bargaining units' interest is towards their members first and foremost. The policy should balance that, in my opinion, by adding a statement such as, although negotiation with the bargaining unit units is vital, however, the effectiveness and the welfare of all our students shall be at the center of our attention. The policy, in my opinion, is not balanced in the current language. Last but not least, a policy could be vague because it complies with the, with the law, lawyer's recommendations. However, I think it needs to be, that needs to be balanced by being clear to the public and clear to the teachers and to the students. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Diana Bergman. Hi, I have a lot to say about policy um, 4004 as regarding evaluation. I have concerns regarding striking the language of an important function. This is a very important function for our administrators and managers and supervisors in BCPS to be able to have the opportunity to evaluate um, their staff members that they're responsible for. And it's a, a proactive practice that a lot of people do. Um, I would recommend that um, we keep that language there and provide um, an explanation kind of um, related to this policy that would outline that not only that we do an evaluation of employees, but that we actually have a system in place, like a cycle, that when you're doing evaluations of your employee, it's also required to come back and check to see how they've performed. I think in the past, we have had a shortage in administration to be able to do all the evaluations of all our staff to see if what we're implementing is actually working because we don't come back to do the reevaluation check to see on their performance. Um, and, and a decent amount of time that could be productive. So I would, I would recommend that we keep that language of important function because it's an extremely important function of our school system in the policy. And also in addition to this policy, add the, not just the, the implementation, but reassurance of confirmation from the superintendent in the rule that we're gonna have some systematic systems to recheck the evaluation time to make sure that what we're doing is productive. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Carol Vidal. Hi again. Um, I just have a really short comment about this policy. I would like the board to consider the very creative and bold idea of including parent and student evaluations in personal evaluations. It is now very common in other professional settings such as in healthcare to have 360 evaluations that include evaluations from managers and also peers and clients, as well as evaluations of managers and administrators. I would suggest including this in the policy. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have policy 5470, Students, Services to Students and Wellness. Our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seroff. Good evening. Um, basically, what I have to say is that we need to now consider the item of the virtual learning platform because there are students and parents and teachers that have needs in, in the wellness area, have service needs that 
we haven't been willing to address on the virtual platform, and we need to do it. These students, these teachers, and these parents of these students have the same rights as the individuals who are learning in person, and they should be provided with the same level of services. If you are providing a social work service to students in the classroom, in person, you need to do the same thing for the students who are virtual, and you need to include that in your language. I'm glad to see that this particular um, 5470 has been sent back to the committee, and I think that we should take further time to include parents and teachers and students on the virtual platform. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have um, Mary Taylor. Ms. Taylor? Hello. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make some comments on Policy 5470, Services to Students Wellness. Um, I know that the categories include 10 different uh, subjects, so um, it's the categories are recommended by the CDC whole school, whole child, whole community model. So during the past during the past year of remote and hybrid learning, many of these categories have been adequately have they been adequately addressed? What is the plan moving forward to emphasize the importance of these categories and the impact on the whole child? With that said and whole child wellness in mind, let's examine a few on the list. Number one, physical education and physical activity. If Baltimore County Rec and Parks are now open, why is BCPS still keeping playgrounds closed and physical activity at a minimum? When will our playgrounds be open? Also, Governor Hogan lifted the outdoor mask mandate. Allowing our children to unmask and breathe outdoor air would be wonderful. Number two, nutrition, environment, and services. Not sure what you all had for lunch today, but a beef stick, a slab of cheese, a yogurt, and a bag of Cheez-Its is not a nutritional lunch. Why isn't a hot meal available to all students? Are we out of budget funds already? Counseling, uh, psychological, and social services. We have no idea what damage these lockdowns have done to our kids. Counseling, psychological, and social services are a much needed resource now more than ever. These services need to be a top priority. I also would like to take this opportunity to remember Michael Moronic Jr., a student from Delaney High School, who committed suicide back in October 2020 due to the stress of COVID school lockdowns. His parents, Michael Sr. and Heather, have started a foundation called Arrow of Light Foundation to educate and hopefully prevent it from happening to another family. And number four, social emotional school climate. Let's talk about plexiglass. When is BCPS going to remove the plexiglass being used around the desks and in the cafeteria? If you want a social and emotional school climate, start there. CDC says it's useless, and even BCPS reopening plan said it was not necessary to open the schools. And while some schools took great initiative to develop a welcoming school environment, many others allowed administrators to use their own fears and lack of clear scientific data to open their schools. A clear equitable guideline for school environments should be developed and implemented immediately. And after a year of unpredicted disruptions, we look forward to the next timely assessment evaluation and revisions to address thank the you. wellness of the whole child. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next we have Mr. Bash Farone. Good evening to all. A policy 5470 promotes student health and well-being and their ability to learn and their physical and mental well-being. In line 36, the policy calls for attention to the social and emotional school climate. And in line 40, the policy calls for family engagement. In line 18, the policy calls for parent and family involvement. 
all the above language in that policy is a matter of niceties, but they really fail to address the issues of BCPS and the society that we all are serving. The problem of drugs, the problems of alcohol, the problems of obesity because of consuming too much calories, the problems of smoking, the problems of bullying, the problems of defamation. And an example of that, what I alluded to in a previous policy about the curriculum um, teaching hate and defamation based on religious affiliation. Most of our society diseases are really self-inflicted, and the school system needs to reverse that by having a policy that have clear effect on drugs, alcohol, obesity, smoking, and bullying, and defamation, and stereotypes. Although this policy may be written in a very nice language, however, I don't see that it really adds to correct the problems that we are suffering in the school system and in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Diana Bergman. Hi, my name is Diana Bergman, and I'm speaking on behalf of policy 5470. I would like to draw your attention to section two standards or a list of 10 categories. Um, I think that we should add a category regarding financial literacy. Um, I think it's important to to not just to improve the wellness and the, the health of the school community climate. In some communities, if we're gonna offer wraparound services, we also have to be able to provide financial literacy to that community so it could be improved and they could have knowledge information. And it should be made available in multiple languages um, just so you get over that language barrier for the resources. Um, Blueprint for Our Future has given us uh, additional support to be able to implement a policy like 5470 when it comes to wraparound services and community school programs. This is one of these policies that actually goes hand in hand with the vision of, the, of Maryland's Blueprint for wraparound services. So please consider adding language to include that financial literacy component because unfortunately healthcare is not free for everybody. And there comes, um, there's a lack of inequity, you know, we have inequity when it comes to healthcare coverage. And that's part of healthy and, and, and wellness. We, we need to be able to inform people of how much they could pay on their policies for healthcare and make sure that they understand that financial literacy component to it. So thank you for your time, and I, I really like this policy, um, and I'm glad that more additional information is being added to it. And congratulations to the Chief of School Climate and Safety and school officials that have worked tremendously to improve this area of our um, school community as well. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Carol Vidal. Hi again, thank you. Uh, I also want to say that I like the policy. I think it could use some improvement. Um, it, I just want to restate uh, the, the paragraph that I wrote. Like it says that the board is committed to providing a school environment that promotes students' health, well-being, and ability to learn, and acknowledges that students need access to healthy foods and physical activity, health and counseling services, and the support of the school family and community to learn and thrive, and that the board supports a coordinated approach to school health, understanding that many school programs and services support student health and wellness. And then also those programs and, and services will fall into a CDC model with 10 categories that include school, community, and child. And these 10 categories include aspects like um, physical education and physical activity, nutrition, counseling, social and emotional cl um, school climate, physical environment, and also employee wellness and community engagement. Um, and then also that the superintendent will seek advice from the, um, the Baltimore County Health Council 
And in these areas of health, nutrition, and wellness matters, and we'll focus on goals on those areas. I have to say about the policy that points two, three, and four of the policy are very specific about nutrition, and I highly support the provision and communication of nutrition guidelines and standards. However, the policy is very centered on nutrition and not focused enough on all aspects of health and well-being that are included in the other nine um, CDC categories. For example, VCTS schools have had a rather reactive rather than proactive response to issues such as lead in the water in some of the older school buildings. This issue falls under the category of physical environment and calls for a more specific uh, policy for safety in the school environment. A proactive approach to the physical environment would also have ensured that ventilation systems were ready during the pandemic. And most important, I'm asking the board members to seriously consider specifying mental health needs and programs in this policy as much as nutrition. As it has been clear this year, the focus of VCPS and many other districts has been infection prevention, while other aspects such as mental health and quality education, equally or more important for children, have been ignored. Student wellness includes a more individualized approach to the student's needs, and it also involves having enough support from mental health providers in the school system so that educators can focus on doing their job. Finally, one of the concerns of many parents are surrounding the responses from the CPS system to um, certain instances of bullying. And uh, while I know universal practices have been implemented, many teachers have been feeling disempowered by confusing directions given by the system, and many children have left the system due to their experiences in the school. Bullying and school climate require consideration as well, and there's no mention of it in the policy. And I already commented on family and community engagement in policy 1270, and uh, there's also no mention of employee wellness in this policy, which I know is an issue, and, but I won't comment on it as I know many other stakeholders are regularly talking about it in the meetings. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have Ms. Jen Reed Holm. Hello. Yes, please Hello. go ahead. Oh, thank you. I'm interested in the wellness policy and how it exactly is being implemented in regards to provided meals. A few years ago, our family suffered a house fire and BCPS deemed us homeless at the time, even though we had a place to live, a hotel. This opened up funding for my kids to automatically receive free breakfast and lunch. It was extremely helpful to us while we were dealing with a lot at the time. After a few months, I noticed my daughter had gained more weight than that was normal for her age, and my son was exhibiting ADHD symptoms that were height, more heightened than typical. It occurred to me that something about the food from school may be to blame. I will preface this with that we are not a family who eats organically. We strive for good nutrition, but we are also realistic. We buy chips and ice cream and other treats from time to time, and we even visit the occasional fast food restaurant. Although far from perfect, the goal is always to have healthy, balanced meals whenever possible. One day, I decided to walk into the cafeteria line, and I was appalled by the options available. I thought it was maybe an off day, so I walked in on another day for comparison. After some research and speaking with our pediatrician, the foods and drinks that are being served are a disservice to the students. Although trying to do a good thing by feeding kids so they can adequately learn without hunger, they're actually being set up to fail. Let me explain. After a phone call with food and nutrition, the, guide, the guidelines schools are supposed to follow are provided by the federal government. Well, I'm sure we can all say how well the guidelines from the government are working for reopening schools, right? And how BCPS will do the bare minimum whenever possible. You should be concerned. I was told they had to have two whole grains or meat, a dairy and a vegetable. What does this mean for BCPS? As long as the food item qualifies by having an ingredient like grain within the food, it is acceptable. It has nothing to do with the other ingredients around the main requirement. This is unacceptable when BCPS is just looking for the cheapest option. Pop-tarts are essentially a cookie, but to BCPS it meets the standard because it can be considered a grain. Food dyes are in many of the foods, and if you don't think that is a problem, it is. This affects focus and concentration for many students with ADHD, identified or not. The same effect happens with another artificial ingredient called carrageenan, which is often found in items like chocolate milk as a thickening agent. I'm hearing of foods being served right now, such as meat sticks, because it counts as a meat, that are loaded with sodium and other garbage ingredients, essentially dehydrating children who are already dehydrated from wearing masks all day, as well as Trix yogurt that counts as dairy loaded with sugar and sodium. 
BCPS is not helping underserved children by setting them up for success with meals, but rather with inferior food products that are harmful to their focus, overall health, and ultimately their success. Just because the federal mandates the minimum, the minimum doesn't mean you have to strive to achieve it. Let's better do better by these families and provide actual healthy foods and better ingredients. I think this policy should be reviewed to include better quality of foods, not just minimum standards, to set kids up for healthy success. Thank you. Thank you. And um, that's the end of our um, public comments and our comments on policy. So thank you, everyone, for that. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, Team BCPS. It is a pleasure to speak directly to our BCPS educators on Teacher Appreciation Day and Week. We know that our students rely on our teachers for academic rigor and social emotional learning. Throughout the pandemic, our teachers have provided stability and support to students and their families. During my school visits, I'm always impressed by the quality of instruction and the level of care for my educators. So from the bottom of my heart, I recognize and thank all BCPS teachers for your hard work and dedication. Happy Teacher Appreciation Day and Week. Last week, I had the opportunity to announce that Brianna Ross was chosen from 157 nominees to serve as BCPS 2021-2022 Teacher of the Year. Ms. Ross is a social studies teacher at Deer Park Middle Magnet School. She has leadership experience as a social studies department chair and curriculum writer, and she previously taught at Scott's Branch Elementary School. Ms. Ross is known for building positive relationships and providing both instructional excellence and love. Thank you to this year's Teacher of the Year Selection Committee, which included BCPS administrators, staff, and students, TAPCO representatives, and current BCPS Teacher of the Year, Robert Runk. Congratulations, Ms. Ross. In a school year unlike any other, we are celebrating principals in a new way. Instead of identifying principals of the year at the elementary, middle, and high school levels, we are recognizing all BCPS principals because of all they have demonstrated, remarkable commitment and dedication to students, families, and teachers. So during the week of May 17th through the 21st, on our website and on our social media, please look for this year's campaign which is called Celebrating BCPS Principal Excellence. Two BCPS high schools, Eastern Technical High School and Western School of Technology and Environmental Science, were named among the top 10 high schools in Maryland according to the 2021 Best High Schools list compiled by U.S. News and Report, World Report. Three additional BCPS high schools ranked among the top 50 in Maryland, including George Washington Carver, Center for Arts and Technology, Hereford High, and Towson High. These rankings are based on college readiness, math and reading proficiency, math and reading performance, underserved student performance, college curriculum, breadth, and graduation rate. We congratulate these schools and we recognize that there are many ways to measure our schools. We also want to recognize all of our high schools, all 24, for your hard work with students, families, and communities. Looking forward, we will mark an important milestone in our hybrid learning journey when uh, we increase our offering to four days of in-person learning on Monday, May 10th, and on Monday, May 17th. Uh, families may continue to choose full virtual learning. We want to thank our school leadership teams and principals for looking at and, and providing additional support by offering extra tutoring and extra time and support for students during the week. I do want to recognize that on Monday, May 3rd, the annual McCormick Unsung Heroes Awards were held. Each year, McCormick and Company honors Baltimore area male and female high school senior student athletes. This year, a total of $105,000 in college scholarships was awarded to six winners, four of which are from Baltimore County Public Schools. 
Paige Holly, a girls lacrosse player from Parkville High School, was one of two recipients of the $40,000 Charles Perry McCormick College Scholarship Award. The nominations from each school for the Unsung Heroes Award are reviewed by an independent panel, and that group selects one young man and one young woman who have been exemplary in their team contributions to receive the additional recognition. Additionally, Dustin Crotee, a football player from Hereford High School, received a $7,500 scholarship. Aril Jamagio, a soccer player at Owings Mills High School, and Chase Glenn, a basketball player at Western School of Technology and Environmental Science, each received $5,000 scholarships. Congratulations to these exemplary student athletes. As we look even further ahead, BCPS will provide full-time in-person instruction for five days a week to all students for the 21-22 school year. In addition, families who are interested in fully virtual learning option for that school year, for upcoming school year, have been asked to indicate their interest through an online form by Friday, May 7th. This form is available at www.bcps. Org. More information about our plans will be provided this evening by the design team as well as additional information in the upcoming board meetings. Thank you and this concludes my report. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the board chair report. That's my report and um, I am wanting to um, Again, congratulate Ms. Ross um, for Teacher of the Year, but also I'm trying something different. I have a video that I put together um, where I am talking about the different things going on at BCPS. So if that's ready, um, we can go ahead and show that. Should be coming up shortly. Hello, my name is Makita Scott, and I am the chairwoman of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In this new series, I am putting the spotlight on BCPS students and educators for an inside look at teaching and learning today. I'd like to start by recognizing next year's BCPS Teacher of the Year, Ms. Brianna Ross. As the chair of the board's equity committee, I appreciate Ms. Ross's passionate advocacy for equity. Congratulations, Ms. Ross. We all know that this school year has been very different because of the pandemic. Today, I will share with you how virtual learning created new opportunities for BCPS students in the Maryland MESA, MESA initiative. Our sponsor is the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. Maryland MESA focuses on STEM, which stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. The goal is to prepare students who are are traditionally underrepresented in STEM to graduate from a two-year or four-year college or university with a degree in STEM. 34 elementary, middle, high school teams and high school teams from 14 of our schools participated in Maryland Mesa this year. Let's take a look at one of the challenges with students from Chadwick Elementary, Windsor Mill Middle, and Milford Mill Academy. Teams had to construct durable structures that could fit inside a small container and then be expanded to its full size. This is the kind of challenge faced by NASA every time a satellite is put into orbit. Due to the pandemic, student teams had to collaborate virtually to create one solution and had to devise a method for testing their structure with household materials. Winning teams represented the county at the state tournament on Saturday, May 1st. 
It is clear that this unique program engages students in hands-on STEM activities with the support of their team coaches. I am also struck by the range of skills that students are developing in this one challenge. So that's it for today. I hope that you will join us next time from the Chairwoman's Corner. And I thank you for joining me today. And I look forward to speaking with you again. Thank you so much. <laughs> Something a little different from the Chairwoman's Corner. <laughs> Thank you all for your kindness. I appreciate it. And thank you, um, BCPS um, staff and studio. And, um, give, and thank you for our children, everyone giving me a chance to highlight some of the great work that we're doing. So thank you. So the next item on the agenda is um, the student member of the board, Mr. Mahamza. Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and fellow board members, I remember my ninth grade uh, teacher, my ninth grade AP government teacher, Mr. Degas, who challenged me to be more civically involved and helped cultivate my interest in politics and government. My middle school tennis coach, Mr. Sinclair, showed me what athletic grit looked like and pushed me to be both a great student and an athlete. And my high school librarian, Ms. Navin, who welcomed me into the library and openly engaged in many conversations with me as I attempted to answer the many queries that involved in my mind. These are some of the these are some of the many uh, teachers that have helped nurture me as a student and prepared me for life after high school. This week, we honor the many educators that. We, this week, we honor the many educators that, in some way or another, have had a tremendous impact on our lives. Our educators are heroes that are often uh, don't get acknowledged until years later in our lives. I've been lucky this year to meet and interact with many educators in our county who have each uh, done their part to make a difference in our students' lives. To all our teachers, I want to say that uh, we as students appreciate you and thank you for all the work that you do. During this week, I hope we can all reflect on the impact that teachers have had on our lives and work to support them. And I also want to congratulate our Teacher of the Year, Ms. Ross. Since my last report, I've continued meeting with students virtually, answering questions ranging from academics, spring sports, student leadership, and senior activities. Later this week, I will also visit two high schools, Milford Mill Academy and Randallstown High, uh, high School, to check on how high schoolers are uh, on the west side are faring during hi hybrid learning. I look forward to future conversations with students and, uh, and also school visits as the end of my term nears. I want to congratulate our seniors who just this week accomplished another major milestone, committing to the college or choosing to pursue different pathways. Our seniors have worked hard throughout their academic career, some even facing adversity, and still they persevered. To all our seniors, I want to say that I'm proud of you and I wish, uh, wish you the very best with your future endeavors. Lastly, I want to wish my mother and all the mothers who are listening a happy Mother's Day. May the fourth be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahomes. <laughs> all right. So the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Bersades. Good evening, Ms. Scott. Nothing to report from closed session. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the Board of Education. Tonight, the team and I will be providing an update on reopening, and actually, I will be focusing on the process to recover and rebuild. That's the work that we began and will continue during these next several months. Next slide, please. We are pleased to share our thinking and planning with you this evening as we look towards the new year. Our focus is on recovery and rebuilding. We know that this has been a challenging year for everyone. It does not matter whether you are a student, staff member, leader, or parent. 
whether you are a leader in your first year or 30th year, it has been challenging for all of us. While we certainly acknowledge that this has been a tough year, we know that better times are on the horizon. We know this because we have the benefit of the collective expertise of a school system filled with leaders who have been tested and know what to anticipate as well as how to respond. Our system's ability to predict the unpredictable, apply the lesson learned from the past year in partnership with our families and communities, and ability to adapt will serve our students well in the next phase of recovery and rebuilding. I want to thank you for your candor during these last few months. Based on your feedback, thoughts, and considerations, I'm confident that the information that follows reflect our collective priorities moving forward. Staff members will share key components of our current work, including updates focused on technology, staffing, summer highlights and opportunities, fall return to in-person learning, and next year's digital learning option for families. We also will provide an update on our four-day expansion as, as well as highlight our health and safety mitigation strategies in collaboration with our health advisory and local health department. Our hope is that you will see and hear our commitment to Team DCTS. Next slide. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Dr. Scriven. Thank you, Dr. Williams. So prior to the pandemic closure, the usage of internet was well below our capacity resource, and it was sufficient when all students were virtual. We had access to 20 gigabit of internet and 40 gigabit of our rated firewall. When the hybrid mode began in March and Google Meet uh, was being used both face-to-face -face and virtual, the usage level caused inner net usage to rise and impacted our firewall. We experienced a full outage on April 8th, a substantial outage on April 9th, and have still been experiencing intermittent outages, internet outages. To alleviate these internet or intermittent outages, we've restricted Google Meets face-to-face -to, -face to allow teachers uh, to be able to constantly or consistently access their virtual students. Additionally, we stood up a second path to the internet by temporarily installing additional firewalls. We still have been experiencing some interruptions while tuning this configuration. And an example was today, we had a seven minute uh, intermittent interruption uh, at a subset of our schools. Next slide, please. So our path moving forward. The new firewall upgrades were delivered on April 30th. Uh, installation is currently in progress and we're looking at turning on the new upgraded firewalls on Monday, May 10th, which will give us the capacity to have anywhere up to 40 to 60 gigabit of internet and up to 200 gigabit of throughput from our firewalls or to our firewalls. Next slide, please. Our ultimate goal is for all students to participate to participate in Google Meets at its full capacity. The new BCPS firewall solution will allow for continued growth uh, during our uh, FY 2022 or school year 2022. And data will be collected from March all the way through June of 2021 as we're now establishing a baseline uh, in terms of our bandwidth usage currently and moving forward. BCPS continues to frame the learning environment for 2021-2022, and DOIT will modify the infrastructure to support 
the educational model. So in addition to internet access, we are also working to establish the following efficiencies uh, to enhance our IT ecosystem. We are one looking at a single password using the user's Microsoft account to authenticate to Google, Schoology, Focus, Advantage Financial, as well as additional tools in BCPS. Secondly, we are rebuilding the BCPS1 application resource page within Office 365. And thirdly, we are looking at creating a process to grant parents access to systems without requiring them to use their student accounts to log in. Thank you for moving the slide. And I would ask to go to the next slide and yield the floor to Mrs. Lowry at this time. Thank you. To support hiring for the fall, the Office of Staffing recently held the BCPS Teacher Job Fair. This year, the job fair was conducted virtually and all schools participated. Now, through the end of the school year, the Office of Staffing has scheduled multiple teacher screening sessions each week to target all content areas for elementary and secondary. Screening sessions will continue through the summer months for targeted need areas. On May 14th, we will host a virtual diversity job fair. Applicants will have the opportunity to meet with school-based administrators and learn more about teaching and leading in BCPS. On June 24th, we will host our BCPS summer teacher recruitment fair. Principals will have the opportunity to connect for the specific teacher vacancies they have for the remaining um, school year upcoming for FY22. Hiring for summer programs is currently underway. The application process is currently open and scheduled to close at the end of this week. The Office of Staffing works with the administrators and coordinators to fill all summer program opportunities. In addition, the Office of Staffing works closely with our Division of Business Services to hire additional staff for summer cleaning and food services. Staffing for the fall BCPS virtual learning program is currently being reviewed. The Office of Staffing is working collaboratively with Dr. Boswell McCumas and the Division of Curriculum and Instruction to identify the staffing needs, roles, and responsibilities necessary to implement the BCPS virtual learning program. The interest survey completed by families will provide an idea of the possible number of dedicated staff needed to implement the BCPS virtual learning program. We will solicit staff to get their interest and to create a pool of candidates to staff this option. In addition, the Office of Staffing will work with the Division of Business Services to address staffing needs to support any changes that are necessary based on implementing the virtual model. Next slide, please. And I will pass it off to Dr. Boswell McComas. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, walk through our summer learning programs in a little bit more detail. You may remember that back when March 23rd, just prior to our spring break, I was able to share with you then uh, our, where we were with planning for summer programs. And what you see on the screen before you is the wide array of resources that we are offering this summer. Uh, for summer learning programs. So I'll begin and I'll just talk right across each of these programs and share with you the, the number of students that we anticipate serving in each of these programs. So first I'll begin as always with our extended school year program. This is a program uh, specifically for students that are eligible through the IEP process. Typically these are students who um, need the summer uh, support so that there is not um, any regression. And again, students are eligible for that through the specific IEP process. We will be be offering that um, both in person and for those that um, need a virtual pathway uh, for health and safety reasons, we will be working with those families as well. Second, you'll see on the screen, Bridge the Kindergarten. We're very excited. This is a brand new offering this summer, uh, thanks to a grant through the state of Maryland to support early learners um, in response to the pandemic. Our Bridge to, kind um, excuse me, our Bridge to Kindergarten program um, will be in person only and we anticipate serving about 1,640 students in that program uh, through the grant. 
um, I'm sorry, let me step back a second. Extended school year program for uh, special education students that qualify for that in their IEP. We anticipate serving um, around 4,000 students are eligible for the extended school year program. The kindergarten program, we expect serving 1,640, 1,640 students. Thank you. And then moving on to our extended learning opportunity, we often refer to this as ELO. This is our uh, traditional Title I program um, that will be serving in total 67 schools this year. Uh, and this program um, focuses on literacy and mathematics. and. Um, we anticipate serving around 5,700 students in this program this summer. This likewise will be offered both in person and a virtual format. And I'd like to just add that we are working to the fullest extent possible to provide, uh, make our virtual format a dedicated format so that it's not concurrent. Uh, because we know everyone prefers to be able to fully dedicate uh, their attention to either students in person or students um, in a virtual format. Um, and concurrent would only be if uh, staffing were a challenge for us. So to the fullest extent possible, we're going to have dedicated staffing. Moving on, of course, uh, we continue every year to offer uh, summer supports to our English speakers of other languages or our ESOL program. This summer program um, focuses primarily on our students um, that are um, categorized as L1s and L2s, meaning that they have their language proficiency is at level one or level two, which means they have the least amount of English proficiency just yet. Um, and so, of course, this is meant to help uh, advance their proficiency throughout the summer. Um, at this, um, in this program, we anticipate serving about 610 students. We continue to expand this uh, offering each year uh, and likewise will be offered in person and in a virtual format. Moving on, we have our extended year learning program. Our extended year learning program is a program for secondary students, so students in grades 6 to 12. And, and this program is typically offered, I'll start with high school um, students first, students who may be behind on credits uh, for graduation, and they're trying to either recover credits that they did not complete previously, or we often also have students who are trying to accelerate or get ahead on their credit options. The middle school program is, is offered for students who um, were struggling in their core areas and again focuses primarily on math and literacy, but in um, applied areas and, and ways to apply the skill set. So it's a little more, um, it's just a complementary to this sort of traditional school setting. Um, moving on, to, excuse me, uh, Math Academy. Math Academy also is a secondary program that services middle and high school students. And Math Academy uh, obviously focuses on strengthening um, and building mathematics skills uh, for students in that program. The Math Academy program, we anticipate serving uh, a total of 1,680 students in that program. Um, ECAP is our early college high school program. Many of you are familiar with, uh, we have a wonderful partnership with our community college, CCBC, and we have a unique magnet program at Woodlawn High School called the Early College um, Access Program, or ECAP. Um, and in our partnership with um, CCBC, we have um, learned that we need to really provide our students in this program um, continuous support, sort of wraparound support throughout the school year. These students, for those of you who are not familiar with this program, Program, are pursuing both their high school diploma and their associate's diploma all within the same four years. So the idea is that when they graduate at the end of this program, they walk across the stage with both their BCPS diploma and their CCBC diploma in hand. And so this um, summer learning opportunity um, is fully virtual. It is not in person because it is really uh, done in partnership with the faculty and our our partnership with CCBC. Um, and then moving on, uh, every school um, has the capacity as well uh, to develop um, complementary summer learning programs that specifically address the needs of their school community um, as well. And then uh, last but not least, last summer, uh, many of you are familiar with, we um, launched the Summer Learning Hike Program. The Summer Learning Hike Program was um, a, or and is a self-paced digital learning program. 
So what I mean by that is uh, students are not really interacting with the teacher. It is, uh, it begins the very first week of summer and runs all the way through to uh, the day before school starts. So last year we were able to run it for 10 weeks. Uh, it's offered for students in grades kindergarten through 12th grade. And this is completely optional and it's available to every single student in Baltimore County Schools. Students and families can log on and work through the literacy and the math components of this at will. So, and I will I will just share with you last year's data that we were pleased to see last year, which was our first time using uh, this approach. We had 49,100 students served last year, and the average rate of participation in the summer learning hike last year was averaging 12,000 students per week across the summer. So we are excited to offer that as well. Uh, families can use that, whether they're on vacation at home, if they're visiting relatives, um, it's fully accessible in that way. So that, um, I want to just share with you the full array of what we have um, developed for summer learning. Thank you, Dr. Hager. And um, in total, I just want to highlight that excluding the summer learning hike, um, we are anticipate serving in totality 17,820 students in our system-wide programs. Our summer learning hike, as I shared with you last year, we had up to 49,000 students using it throughout the summer. Uh, and then our school developed programs um, can extend our footprint of summer learning as well. And so I hope that I've been able to bring forward to you um, some very positive things for our, our students and families to look forward to this summer um, as we continue our journey back to the next normal of next school year. So at that, I will go ahead and turn it over to um, Ms. Lagerman, our uh, Acting Chief of Organizational Effectiveness. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Basil McComas. I'm thrilled to be able to share a continuation of the sunny thoughts of the summer professional development that we will be offering for our educators and our leaders. And these are just some highlights to give you from our summer professional development counter, calendar. All of that is in full alignment to uh, the, building the system-wide capacity through the compass, alignment with that as well as highlighting the teaching and learning framework implementation, school progress planning, and our overall commitment to raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing students for college career and service. So some of the highlights on the screen are the new Administrators Academy, which is when we welcome new principals and assistant principals into our family of Team BCPS. And also over the summer in July, we'll be having the Summer Institute empowering teams for cohesive progress planning. And that will be focusing on a deep dive into the data analysis, reflection and professional learning planning for school progress plans for our, our schools. The summer symposium will follow after that, and those will be some additional optional professional learning activities that will be recorded as well so that they can be utilized throughout the year, um, as well as just in time over the summer, if that's convenient. And new educator orientation, always one of our favorites to welcome and onboard our new educators in August. And lastly, we wanted to highlight that there will be a myriad of curriculum specific professional development opportunities offered as well over the summer. So these are just a few of the many things that we are excited to bring to you and to Team BCPS uh, this summer and continue our learning and growing together. And then we'll shift on the next slide to Dr. George Roberts sharing a little bit about the four day expanded learning as well. Great, thank you, Ms. Lagerman, and good evening. I shared with the Board of Education and community last month and based on current CDC social distancing requirements of three feet for elementary students and six feet for secondary students, BCPS is looking forward to implementing a four-day expanded learning opportunity for these students. At the elementary level and each public separate day school, all families have the opportunity to opt into four-day learning or remain virtual. This opportunity will begin on Monday, May 10th for these students. At the secondary level, all IEP and 504 students were invited to participate in four-day expanded learning. In addition, select non-IEP or 504 students based on each school's current social distancing capacity, school progress plan, and related data were invited to participate in four-day learning. Again, due to the CDC six-foot social distancing requirement for secondary schools, not all secondary students were permitted to opt into four-day learning. Secondary principals have worked diligently, though, to identify students in the greatest need of this opportunity as they continue to prepare to welcome these students on Monday, May 17th. 
Wednesdays will remain asynchronous as scheduled for the remainder of this school year for all students. And at this time, Dr. Zarchin will provide information regarding current CDC health and safety mitigation practices in our schools. Dr. Zarchin. Thank you, Dr. Roberts, and good evening. The CDC graphic displayed addresses prevention measures for outdoor activities. As we continue on our path to gradually reopen schools, we are slowly removing mitigation requirements in a systematic fashion. For now, masks are still required for BCPS outdoor activities. With the exception of vaccinations, masks are likely to be the single most effective mitigation that we use in schools. Some key reasons for masks to continue to be required include, very few students are fully vaccinated. Most are not yet eligible for the vaccine, although that may be changing soon. Many of our younger students have a limited concept of three or six feet of physical distancing and often cluster together more closely. Our data has shown the highest incident of COVID cases among our student athletes. In school, students are not with small groups of vaccinated individuals. The next step in our gradual reopening is to increase the number of days students are involved in learning. We will continue to monitor the cases and patterns of transmission very closely. We will continue to monitor state and CDC guidance. As the transmission metrics improve, we expect that more mitigation requirements will be relaxed. As we move to the next slide, I would like to welcome Ms. Byers. So thank you, Dr. Zarchin, and good evening, everyone. As we continue to uh, plan for our students who will be coming back four days a week, and as you heard, we are vigorously planning for the summer, for professional learning, and for extended learning opportunities for our students, we are also gearing up for the fall. We are excited that when we reopen in the fall in alignment with the state mandate and our goals as a school system, we will be inviting all of our students back for an opportunity to participate in face-to-face -face learning five days a week. In terms of our mitigation strategies, as you just heard from Dr. Zarchin, we will continue to follow the science and implement the recommended mitigation strategies in collaboration with the CDC, the Maryland State Department of Health, the Baltimore County Department of Health, and other um, experts that we consult regularly in the field. Additionally, we are excited about exploring an expanded COVID-19 testing program in our schools, as well as the potential of hosting uh, vaccine clinics while all staff members continue to have the opportunity to access vaccines. One of the components that we will have to continue to monitor and evaluate when we return in the fall is transportation. We will consult with our health partners, we'll follow the recommended guidance, and we will collaborate with similarly sized neighboring school districts to problem solve and find creative ways to meet those demands. At this time, we're going to, I'm going to pass things over to uh, Dr. Jones, who's going to share a little bit more about our virtual learning program for the fall. Dr. Jones. Uh, thank you, Ms. Byers, and good evening, everyone. As was stated, um, BCPS will also implement a virtual learning program in addition to the five days of face-to-face in-person learning. This BCPS's virtual learning program will be offered during the 2021-22 school year. This is a collaborative initiative involving a cross-functional team that involves the Division of Curriculum Instruction, Division of School Support and Achievement, Business Services, Division of Research Accountability and Assessment, and the Division of Human Resources. Stakeholders will also be engaged throughout this process to provide feedback, and to ensure a coordinated response and high quality program for students and families choosing a virtual pathway. Dr. Boswell McComas will share more about the slide in front of you regarding our virtual learning program and provide a status update. Dr. McComas? Yes, thank you. So um, 
Where we are with virtual learning is um, we are actively in the process of working through the um, information and logistics. What we would are prepared to share with everyone this evening is that um, we did, as everyone knows, we sent out just a high level initial um, form to gauge a, a, a surface level interest. And from that, uh, later on, we will have an actual registration process that, that people would complete. But at this point, we needed some data to really drill into staffing and programming. And so we will be asking, um, once we get to the registration process, we will be asking families to make a full-time enrollment commitment, meaning that the commitment is for the year. I will, however, say that uh, we certainly recognize there uh, will be need to be a process in place by which if families need to adjust, that we can work with them on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis to make that adjustments. But we are asking for a year-long commitment. We are prepared to dedicate staffing so that, again, this is dedicated staffing to provide high-quality virtual learning. And when I talk about virtual learning, I am using the uh, state MSDE definition of blended learning, uh, where we have teachers teaching live to students through um, the, the platform. Um, and students will have um, both live interaction and work with their teachers and their fellow students, but they would also have some independent practice, just as we do in the real uh, brick and mortar classroom as well. Uh, again, the registration process will be followed after our next board meeting uh, when we're able to bring back more details around all of the programming and the logistics. And of course, we are keeping in mind in our planning process that students in this program would have access to extracurriculars, access to food programs, access to all the services that we would expect students to have access to uh, in a brick and mortar setting. Um, we are at this point not um, necessarily doing an application process. That would actually come as part of the registration process. The application would. Um, aspect of that would help us identify what courses uh, your student would need, what other services your student would need. So that's really what we mean by application process there. So that gives you an update of where we are. We want to appreciate all the families that have, as of yet, uh, completed our initial um, form to, to demonstrate interest. Um, and uh, we look forward to bringing back a much more detailed uh, plan to everyone on May 18th. So at this point, I'm going to hand it right over to Dr. Williams uh, to take us uh, through the end. Thank you. So let me thank the team for giving just some highlights of some next steps. As Dr. McComas, Boswell McComas shared, we're scheduled to provide an update on May 18th, specifically on the fall opening plans and updates can be provided at that time. I will continue to update the board, our community and team BCPS about our plans, any additional information from our Maryland Health Department, our state superintendent and or the Maryland State Department of Education and our local health department and health advisory group. Additionally, on May 18th, we hope to have additional information regarding athletics. Uh, so tonight uh, we can uh, gather any questions and provide a written update and make available to the public. I will turn it back over to Chairwoman Scott for comments and the design team will provide brief responses and can follow up with greater details if there are questions and if necessary. So thank you all. Great. Thank you, Dr. Williams and staff for that um, presentation. So it looks like we do have some questions from board members. So I'm going to go in order. Um, first, it looks like we have a question from um, Ms. Lily Rowe. Hi, yes, thank you. I would just like for Ms. Dr. McComas to clarify, um, when we're talking about a virtual school option, are we talking about students who are, like we're doing with hybrid, where you have virtual students engaging with students in a physical classroom? Or are we talking about entirely virtually um, where there's the in-person students are in person and the virtual students are virtual, but they're not, we don't have a teacher trying to teach kids in a classroom and virtually at the same time. Is, can you just clarify exactly what we're talking about? 
Yes, ma'am. And thank you actually for asking that question because that's an area that I think it could get very tricky for people to keep clear. So what we are talking about for next fall for the virtual learning program would be uh, similar to what students experienced this previous fall when we weren't in hybrid. So we went from a fully virtual model where the teachers were teaching completely dedicated to the students um, through the virtual platform. As you know, we have now moved into a hybrid model. Um, and as we moved into this combined in-person and virtual, that's when we had to step into concurrent teaching, which is what's happening now. And, and we know that that is not what any of us would, would prefer, but that is, that is what we have to do right now by having our foot in both doors. What we are proposing for next fall is that it would be separate faculty you would have your in-person faculty who are paying attention to students that are there in person with you. And then you would have a separate faculty dedicated to the students in the virtual format. So the students in the virtual format would only be with other students in a virtual format. And that is likewise what we're aiming to do in our summer programs uh, to the fullest extent possible as well. So I hope I answered your question, Ms. Rowe. Yes, you did. Um, so would that be like, a separate LEA and then people would register for that like they do through magnet programs or has that not been worked out yet? Well, that is part of what we are working through. But at this point, we are uh, looking at students would uh, remain co-enrolled with their school because we don't really want students to lose their identity with their school. Um, so it's we're not standing up a separate school. Uh, we're setting up a program. Um, and in that regard, um, students are still connected with their home community. Um, and But that's more of the type of details we'd be able to bring forward um, in the eight, uh, when the 18th, because we are still working through the, the, the details. And much of that is really based on the initial data that we need to, to really understand how many families are interested in this option for next year. Are we doing anything to reach out to current homeschooling families to see if this were an option, if they'd be interested? Well, we have the... Um, the, the interest form is on our public website. So, and I can uh, talk to our homeschooling family uh, liaison uh, within our office. Thank you, Dr. McComas. My pleasure. Thank you. Next, it's um, Ms. Mack. Yes, I have three quick questions. Um, my first question has to do with professional development. Since a lot of our efforts this summer are targeted for students who may have gaps or for students who want to enhance learning, um, are we allocating um, funds? Or are we number one, making sure that the teachers who will be providing um, instruction to these students are up to date on their professional development for things like Open Court, Orton Gillingham letters, and then our interventions um, that we just discussed in curriculum committee for um, secondary schools. So that's my first question. And then number two, are there any funds allocated through either CARES 1, CARES 2, or the American Recovery Act to um, compensate teachers who want to this summer fill any gaps in their professional development that they may have so that they are in a position to provide um, the interventions that we often talk about in curriculum is my first question. Ms. Lagerman or Ms. Uh, Dr. Boswell McComish, you want to respond to oh, that? Thank you. I was pausing because it was curriculum focused, but I'm happy to do the overarching data analysis discussion as well. So I don't know if you want to start with the curriculum piece, Dr. Yes, Boswell McComish, okay. and I can add on if needed. Yes, and, and please, everyone, uh, Dr. McComas is fine just to make it easier for all of us. Um, so we do have Ms. Mack. We are um, building out professional learning for um, teachers who serve in our summer learning program. But as always, we are offering a wide array of content-based uh, curriculum programs that support our, our um, I, I, not to be redundant, the curriculum. So uh, Bridges, Open Court. Um, and so we do run a series of a series of professional learning throughout the summer. Uh, that's something I don't have the schedule right in front of me at this moment. Um, and perhaps that's something I can work uh, to try to provide follow up one around what, how that schedule actually is built out across the summer. And do we compensate teachers for the time that they spend during the summer on professional development? I, I, 
I, I believe that um, our teachers registered for it, and it's a something. And this is Miss Lauderman. You may be able to help me with this one because I think is a matter of also credits that they can get for professional learning. On Yep, depending upon the activity, we offer um, continuing professional development credits, and that will be part of, for example, the uh, Summer Institute for 10-month employees who would be participating that we're giving hourly stipends, uh, as well as um, the option of CPD credits. I, I guess yes, what I'm specifically so asking is, we have had some discussion about the fact that we rely on interventions to help students in reading and things like that, and then we don't really know if all of our teachers who interact with our students have been trained in those interventions. And since we have federal funds available to um, get kids where they need to be, can we think outside of the box and use some of those funds and create something that would incent teachers to want to catch up on any PD that they may have missed because of COVID, classes being canceled, snowstorms, things like that? That's really my question. Thank you, Ms. Mack. I think we'll follow up um, and work with um, Ms. Lagerman and, and Dr. McComas to be able to respond to your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, my, uh, my next question is more, um, it's actually uh, two weeks from now. I'm wondering why Wednesday, May 12th is not a synchronous learning day since students are off on Thursday, May 13th. I am concerned about um, the students in cohort B being at a disadvantage because they're missing an additional day of learning. Ms. Lowry or, or George Duke, can you respond to, or one of the community superintendents respond to the calendar that week? Sure. Um, there were two dates that were part of the MOU um, where there was an agreement um, for creating an asynchronous day. The staff development um, day was not part of that um, agreement. So that is why um, that day was not identified um, for that week. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. And then my sure. last question is, um, I'd like a better understanding of why we are allowing some secondary schools to return four days a week and others not. I asked one of our community superintendents sure. to re, to respond to that question. Absolutely, Dr. Williams. So, Ms. Mack, uh, if I'm understanding your question, there you said there's some secondary schools that are allowing four days and some that are not. That was part of the slide that was presented with respect to schools that are at that six-foot capacity. So we know at secondary schools, based on CDC, it's a six-foot capacity. So every one of our secondary schools is um, designed differently larger classrooms, smaller classrooms, larger open spaces, and so forth, and, and the cafeteria in the larger spaces. So strictly based on that guidelines, schools can, act, can figure out how many kids they can fit. So there are schools that have reached what we reference as that social distancing capacity, which then cannot offer further admittance to students, whereas some schools could offer it based just strictly based on their size and the ability to offer within that six-foot distance. Okay, I'm out of time, so I don't have a follow-up. Thank you. The, the only thing I would add to that is that all of our secondary schools, though, are offering four days a week to targeted groups of students. Thanks. Thank you. Next, it looks like we have Mr. Mahomza. My next, uh, my few questions are for um, Mr. Scrivens. Um, and bear with me, I'm not very familiar with, like, firewalls and technology, so if I misspeak, please correct me. Um, my, question, my first question is a two-part question. Um, does BCPS own or lease these uh, newly installed firewalls, and will the new in installations be removed when should schools go back in person fully? So, Mr. Mahomes, to your first question, yes, we will own these outright. I couldn't quite make out your second question. Oh, sorry. I said, um, will these new installations be removed um, should schools go back in person fully? No, no, they will not be removed. This, this is the uh, new platform that we will be operating on, Mr. Mahomes. Okay, and um, this is just a question of your expertise. Um, would uh, schools, um, 
uh, in the future see um, improvements in Wi-Fi speeds or network speeds uh, as a result of these new installations? Th that is my hope, but I will let Mr. Corns, I'll defer uh, to him to give a little more details on, on that question, Mr. Mahomes. Mr. Corns. Thank you, Dr. Scriven. So, Mr. Mahomes, we are working towards building a capacity on our firewalls <clears throat> that will allow us to um, both leverage the throughput that we currently have uh, to the Internet as well as be able to expand into the, the, the future as much as five years out. The, these firewalls, uh, our, our current ones are at their capacity uh, for how much throughput they can have, so we are limited about how much Internet we can provide to schools. Mm -hmm. uh, these new ones will uh, provide us uh, 200 plus uh, gigabits throughput, uh, which uh, mm -hmm. leveraged against where we're getting about 25 now. So w it gives us room to grow, but also will address um, our need right now. So um, yeah, the, the answer to that is speed of the internet should uh, be either the same for more people uh, okay. is, is really the goal. Okay, and another question from a person who doesn't know much about technology. Um, let's say in the future uh, more gigabytes are needed with the firewall. Um, does it require an installation of parts or it, could it be something that can be done on the web or something? Like let's say, um, you know, like an iCloud, you can purchase new gigabytes. So uh, that, that's a great question, uh, Mr. Mahomes. So uh, what this allows us to do is we, we procure our internet through Comcast. And so with these new firewalls and the, and the pieces that are built around them, um, if we find that we are running short on internet uh, bandwidth, we simply call Comcast like we would at home and ask for a speed increase and the firewalls will accept them. Um, there will be a certain point where we just have to make sure that the rest of the network is ready to support that, but um, it, th this is uh, not going to be uh, pull this one out and put a new one back in so we can get a little bit faster next time. All right, um, this is, oh, and I said that was my last one. Actually, I actually have one more final one. Um, and this is not really concerning reopening, but I'm just curious, um, with new advancement with like 5G and improvements with networks, uh, is your office researching that? Um, and let's say if there's improvements needed, would we have to buy new firewalls? So um, with, with fi 5G advancements would be uh, for our, our hotspots that we would take home, our cell cellular services. Um, our uh, internet that we're, uh, we gain access through now is through fiber optic, which is um, the, the beauty of fiber optic is it has, doesn't have a theoretical speed limit. It's more about um, the optics that you can push through the, the, the fiber of glass. And so um, with, with advancements, the, the best part about um, technologies, they tend to uh, provide um, a bit of a retrofit, like the same form factor that will go a little bit faster until a certain point when you, you do have to look at a, a larger uh, growth. But uh, these devices that we've procured, um, they're next, next generation firewalls um, utilized by multiple uh, um, agencies, including the state of Maryland. The county government uh, uses the same variety uh, that we've got, and so they've got a lot of room to grow and a lot of expansion that can be uh, uh, brought to bear to, to bring up to speed with new technologies as they're introduced. All right, I appreciate that. And I just want to say great job um, over the past couple of weeks addressing these network issues and um, overseeing these new installations. That's all my questions. Thank you. Next we have Ms. Pastor. Well, I'm certain that using Mr. Mahomes' computer did not help me understand one of those questions or any of those answers. So I'm going to go to what I understand. So I want to thank um, staff for the programs that you've outlined for uh, the summer. And my question goes to um, parents. When will parents uh, start hearing about these programs, and I'm just going to carefully assume that that uh, school-based administrators will be helpful in identifying parents so that they can lead them to uh, the specific programs. So I'm just going to ask all mine at one time. So that's one. Um, thank you for the myriad of 
professional development opportunities that you've also listed, especially uh, for those who are first and second year administrators. Uh, but I also want to know, as I've asked before, what um, is planned for our newest teachers, particularly our first year ones who are just coming into facing our young people um, face to face. So what's planned for them? And for the virtual uh, program, I'm glad Ms. Rowe asked that question. I, I think that's one that needed to be really very strongly um, identified. When um, or are you still planning, when will teachers who are interested in being a part of that virtual teaching program begin to inquire about it and, and being a part of a selection program and doing professional development? Because if they've been regular classroom teachers, Obviously, now we want them to step up everything that has been done over the last year uh, to be really proficient in doing virtual uh, teaching using um, that computer. Dr. McComas. Okay, Ms. Fester. Yeah. Oh. Yes, <laughs> I can answer the first and the last questions, and then I'll ask um, Ms. Lagerman to help us with the second question. So, Ms. Pasture, your um, parents should, uh, your first year right in that our school based administrators will be uh, key uh, movers in helping us reach out to our families around the summer learning program. Um, in general, the families should anticipate the last week, week and a half of May. Uh, is when things should be really getting locked in. There may be some schools that are um, working ahead on that, but in general, um, in the upcoming weeks, families should um, have contact from their schools around their options. And as is always the case, if there is a family that um, wants to reach out to their um, school administration, they can do that um, now and ask their questions. Um, in terms of your last question around virtual learning, uh, likewise, in the upcoming um, weeks in May, we will be uh, providing applications for teachers um, to create a pool for teachers who would be interested in teaching in this virtual program. And um, as always, Ms. Pesher, we will be offering professional learning over the summer uh, to make sure that our teachers who are selected and participate in that program um, have all the instructional supports that they need. Uh, we're fortunate that our teachers have had a full year of, of active on the job learning um, in addition to our weekly Wednesday professional development throughout the year. So on that, I'll hand it over to Ms. Lagerman to answer, I think, question number two. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So much. Thank, Thank you. you. And one of one of the things that we love is our time with our new educators in August, and we do have a robust plan for support for them to welcome them, orient them, and also provide the um, social emotional supports they need, as well as the professional learning for supporting their uh, and engaging their students, uh, both with building relationships and having the content knowledge needed to meet their needs. So we have three days planned out in August for them, and that does include um, some face-to-face -face and um, synchronous virtual offerings depending upon um, the school setting and the number of new teachers. One of the things that we are thrilled is we include classroom management, equity, professional conduct, teacher evaluation, all of those things, as well as deep dives into curriculum and content. Um, and so we've been planning that and, and meeting um, monthly with groups from um, Dr. Boswell McComas's team, as well as across all of the divisions to make sure that everyone comes together in their areas of expertise to build this uh, this wonderful week of learning for them. So thank you both. Very welcome. Okay, and next it looks like we have Dr. Hager. Yes, thank you. That was a jam packed and wonderful presentation, and I really appreciate it. I feel like I could ask twenty minutes worth of questions because it was it was so informative. Um, I want to start by piggybacking on something that Ms. Mack said about um, 
the four day a week school decisions for secondary schools. Um, and it's really just a request. Um, I've got a ton of feedback from people who are really confused by why their middle schooler was invited back, but their high schooler wasn't, and their one high schooler was, but the other high schooler wasn't. And so I wonder if there um, could be some sort of a better communication strategy that is put out to really explain that it is a school level decision. Um, and I know that some schools used waiting lists for parents just in case they had extra spots. And I don't know if that could be um, you know, a strategy that might be considered. But again, I, I think that there may have been a little bit of communication issues around that. So I don't know if anyone um, has any thoughts or, or would like to speak to that, or I could just throw it out there as a request. Well, thank you, Dr. Hager, uh, for that <laughs> feedback. Um, I know we've shared that and talked about it at the design team, but if we need to clarify, provide some more information, we'll be happy to do that. We'll, we'll take that back. Thank you. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate that. And then um, we heard a lot in the public comment about um, CDC guidance saying that um, three feet was acceptable with low transmission rates in um, in secondary schools. And it's really not because we don't do cohorting. So I don't know, again, if, if somebody wanted to just take a minute to explain that, just in case people are confused by that guidance, because I know it can be a little bit confusing. But since we aren't cohorting our kids, uh, we can't, we shouldn't be using a three feet uh, metric in middle and high. Is, is that correct? That, that, that is, is correct. Dr. Zarkin, correct. is that you? Yes. Thank okay. you, Dr. Hager. It, it, because we're not able to cohort or have students primarily in one group or class, um, it, and we're still at a high transmission rate. Now, the good news is the, the numbers are moving in a positive direction but we were still in the red zone or high transmission. Um, I'd like to pull Deb Somerville in. Uh, Ms. Somerville, if you could talk about where we are, and, and I know the dashboard was mentioned as well, how we update that and information that's available. Uh, Ms. Somerville? Sure, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sargent. I'm happy to provide an update on the data. Um, so, so, um, I guess, well, just looking at the data for a second, some of the public speakers mentioned, and I think we kind of clarified that the cases are coming down, but we're still really high. Um, it's going to take a little while for us to get down from that surge. Um, but if you look at the dashboard, BCPS dashboard um, is updated each Monday, and it reflects the data for the seven days ending that previous Friday. So the data you see on the dashboard today goes through last Friday. The dashboard shows the number of students and staff reported to have COVID during that week, as well as the number of persons, students and staff to place on quarantine due to exposure at home or in the community, and the number of schools reported that week to the Maryland Department of Health as having an outbreak. These numbers can be seen as totals and also broken down by school. Um, the dashboard also shows the Baltimore County case and positivity rate as calculated by CDC to enable a direct comparison to their guidelines and categories. But because of lags in the CDC calculation of these rates, the data reported on the website each Monday is only up to date through the previous Tuesday. So that's what we have access to on the CDC website each Friday afternoon. Um, so I hope that clarifies a little bit about the dashboard. You know, our rates, um, if I look at our rates today, the most recent seven-day cumulative case rate in Baltimore County is 134. So it still keeps us up above that 100 threshold. Um, I would expect it to come down, but it's been coming down at a steady rate, not precipitously, not dropping from the sky. I hope that helps. Um, yes, I thought it was great. And, and I was also looking at the dashboard, which is, is very well done. Um, so my last question is um, an optimistic one. So if we do see uh, that big drop that you were saying that we haven't experienced quite yet, but if we see it coming, um, do you think we as a school system have room for one more pivot this year to invite more kids back? Um, or is this kind of May 18th date the last time that we are going to make a change this school year? I would just start by saying I think some of that, Dr. Hager, goes back to your original question around cohorting. Um, the qualifier between six feet and three feet that we don't meet still, even if transmission rates are all the way down, 
and we can check that box. Yay. That means healthier people. Um, we don't check the box for cohorting at the secondary level, according to the CDC guidance, because our students and our teachers change classrooms. Yeah, I guess, I guess I'm also hoping maybe the CDC will update it again, but we'll see. I don't, I don't, I don't know of anything coming in the pipeline. Um, I think I'm out of time. So thank you. I'll, I'll send some additional questions by email, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. McMillian. I have a motion to read. I move that all BCPS middle school and high school leadership teams provide all general education, 6th through 12th grade students slash families, the option, and I want to repeat option, to return to four-day in-person instruction starting on Monday, May 17th, 2021. Thank you. Is there a second? A second, Kuhn. Okay, so the motion was made by Mr. McMillian uh, to move that all BCPS middle school and high school leadership teams provide all general education students slash families the option to return to four-day in-person instruction starting on Monday, May 17th, 2021, and that was seconded by Mr. Kuhn. Any, yes, would you like to speak to your motion, Mr. Yes, McMillian? I would, but I... In my typing, I left out after general, all general education, 6 12 students, grade students. So, in the, in the motion that I sent you yesterday, it was correct, but trying to type this in and all these different chats kind of messed me up. Uh, yes, I would like to speak to my, my motion. Our middle school and high school students need to be re socialized into the school culture. In the past, after an eight or nine week summer vacation, it took two or three weeks to get the students ready to learn. As a group, our middle school and high school students have not been together in 13 and a half months, which equates to 58 weeks. If we wait to bring our middle school and high school students together in September, it will be late September or early October before they will be socialized to learn. In my opinion, we can't sacrifice five more weeks this spring. I think we need to start the recovery and rebuilding process on Monday, May 17th. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to restate the motion again with a correction. Um, Mr. Um, McMillian moved that all BCPS middle school and high school leadership teams provide all general education grade 6 to 12 students slash families the option to return to four-day Sorry, to four day in person instruction starting on Monday, May 17th, 2021. And that was seconded by Mr. Offerman. Okay, so it looks like there were some questions to your motion, Mr. McMillian. Um, looks like the first one is Ms. Causey. That was seconded by Mr. Kuhn. Oh, excuse me. It was seconded by Mr. Kuhn. Yes. Um, I was had the first question, Madam Chair. And then I called the question after that. So following Ms. Joe's if we can process my motion to call the question. Okay, it looks like the chat is moving around. So I see, where do you put that in here? Let me just get caught up. Oh, it did look like Ms. Causey was first and then Ms. Joe's, my bad. Yeah, I went back up, um, so. You did get back up. <laughs> All right. mm -hmm. Okay, so was the question called? Did you call the question? I called the question, but Ms. Causey and Ms. Jones yeah. um, put questions in the chat first. So, yes. Yeah. So um, I was just checking to make sure that I'm reviewing it correctly. So I'll go with Ms. Causey and then Ms. Jose. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, thank you to Mr. McMillian for making that motion. Um, I had questions for um, staff. So, um, Ms. Um, Stuart Sicking from CCAC, Special Education Citizens Advisory Council, had uh, made public comment at the board meeting and followed up with an email <clears throat> regarding concerns around privacy for uh, students with IEPs and 504s and struggling students based on comments made at the board meeting and uh, press releases. So has there been any other system-wide communication since the April 16th press release? Communication has been made um, by each school principal as we ask them to use their data to drive decisions. And based on 
uh, as it was reported tonight. Uh, the school leadership teams and principals are looking at additional students to bring back. So we have been working with our school leadership team to provide ongoing communication with family. And as Dr. Hager mentioned about additional system-wide communication to clarify the decision-making and the cohorting, we are happy to provide that as we move forward. Thank you. So <clears throat> there's a number of us parents on the board, and I've also heard from other parents that there are many parents, some with students already in cohort A and B, that have not received any communication from the schools, um, giving them an option. And I uh, respect our leadership, our school leadership, but in this year, how um, is there data that really speaks to each family and each student's circumstances in this pandemic? So, Ms. Causey, yeah. that is, again, school leadership working with their SPP goals, with their data. The school BCPS reopening plan has always focused on our most neediest learners. So following that string to this point, that's what our school leadership teams have been doing for the past uh, few weeks, is looking at their data, looking at their neediest students, looking at and cross-relating to their SPP and their other data points, and then communicating with those families to invite them back. How can it be equitable if parents and students are not given the opportunity to express their particular need, which may not be reflected in data? How is that equitable? And how uh, were the privacy issues addressed because the board did not receive a follow-up on those concerns expressed in a public meeting? I'm sorry, so just wanted to make sure we're speaking to the, we're speaking to the motion. Is, is this related to the motion, Ms. Causey? Yes, ma'am. Like I'm very concerned that it is not equitable how okay. the process was <clears throat> given to the principals to proceed. We know that there's number limitations, okay. but still parents and I believe students should be given the option, and if there is room, they should be allowed to come. But to have uh, parents and students not given the option, to have... Uh, you know, a small group of people selecting who gets the chance to come, that's not equitable. I'm not even sure if that's fate. Um, so I'm very concerned that that's put the school system in a bad circumstance, in addition to not providing students what they need. Okay, Dr. Williams, were well, you I'll responding? Just, I'll you. just respond. Looking at equity, we want to give our students what they need. And based on the data that our schools have been analyzing and the feedback, we're looking at through an equity lens. So we can't compare what one school is doing versus another. The school leadership teams have been working with their community. And there's some, some additional information you want to provide to me or to our community superintendents. We welcome that information if, in fact, there's something happening at, our, at any given school. But the schools have been using data as an equity lens to provide support to students and to open it up and looking at the CDC guidelines with the fact that we talked today about we don't cohort at the secondary school, so we still have to utilize the six feet social distancing. But I thank you for that. If there's some additional information that you have, Ms. Causey, feel free to share. Well, it's that parents and students don't feel that they're being given an equitable chance, especially parents and students that have already opted in for two days and thereby expressed their own need for face-to-face -face instruction. The other question I have is, what is the transmission level at which three feet is appropriate for the secondary schools? Dr. Zarchin or Deb Somerville, are you able to respond to that question? Ms. Gauzy, could you repeat? I caught half of the question, but want to make sure I've, I've captured your question correctly. Certainly. At what transmission level does the CDC guidance indicate that three feet is an appropriate uh, social distancing for secondary schools? So I'm going to let uh, Ms. Somerville respond to that. Would it be possible for her to put the COVID dashboard link we up? Don't, we don't have access to, to posting materials. 
I believe okay. Dr. Haber said she had it. Uh, we're starting to move away from, we, we need to process this motion. So um, was there a response to Ms. Causey's question? Um, Ms. Somerville. Could you repeat the question, if you don't mind, please? Certainly. <clears throat> At what CDC transmission level is it appropriate to have three feet of social distance for secondary students? Um, Ms. Clancy, what the, off the top of my head, I recall that it's under 100. Um, it still encourages to try to cohort students as much as possible, but I believe it's releases after 100, so 99 and below. And that's the number. Okay. Could you explain which I'm number sorry, Ms. that Ms. is? I'm sorry, Ms. Causey, so that is you were out of time. Out of high transmission. Okay, thank you. We need to um, move on. Next is Ms. Jose. So I'm sorry, is, did my time get used up by repeating my question three times? No, it was used up before that. You repeated thank your you. question okay. after it was used up. Thank you. Okay. I'll be supporting this motion. All right, Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, you know, we all want schools to reopen because we must prioritize the reopening of our schools safely. But with guidelines from CDC and the Baltimore County Health Department, I'm a parent, but I would like to ask Dr. Williams, is that a reasonable time frame to open safely? Because I would like to base my decision on empirical evidence and expert opinion. So just a simple yes and no, uh, because we're already letting our kids back in gradually. And uh, the presentation was pretty elaborate. I just want a simple yes and no answer. Is that a reasonable time? Given that we have a lot of overcrowded middle schools and high schools as well. So I just want a very simple answer. Thank you. It is not reasonable. That was what I wanted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jills. And it looks like um, then next Ms. Hen called the question. Yes, thank order. you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, point of order. Point of order, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mahomza. Um, seeing that um, the chat is not um, open to the public under um, the Open Meeting Act, and Ms. Hen called uh, um called the question during the chat and not, was not recognized to call the question. Mm -hmm. I would like um, the parliamentarian's ruling if that is a proper uh, call of the question. Madam Chair, okay. if I may respond. I'm sorry, uh, no, no, if the parliamentarian, uh, Mr. Brusades could no, respond, I, please, because it, that would be the um, appropriate like person to, to respond to. So, I didn't um, make the motion yet, I just okay. made the motion now. I was just like what? Mr. McMillian put the word motion in the chat. I'm sorry, excuse me, Ms. Hen, you were not you were were not recognized. Um, it says in the chat, I call the question and Mr. Bersades, if you are there, could you please weigh in on Mr. Mahomza's um, point of order? And Madam Chair, I excuse me, Ms. Hen, excuse me, you are now out of order. Mr. Bersades, if you could please respond to the question at hand raised by Mr. Mahomza, which was done properly and he was properly recognized, um, if sure. you could do so now. Thank you. Recognized. Sure. So I under understand from what I've seen and heard is that Ms. Han initially put the motion in chat, but then uh, discussed it in the context of having other members ask questions first before having her motion processed. No. So was that your question, Mr. Mahomes? Because that's not how I understood it. What, what Ms. Hen did was call the question indicating in chat. She didn't at, like, say on to speak. She said, I'll call a question. Then when, in, when the chair was calling on her, she said, are you calling a question uh, to, and asking Ms. Hen that? And now my question is, since it was written in chat and the chat is not open to the public for discussion and Ms. Han did not, wasn't recognized to call the question in the public, is that a proper um, call of the question? Madam Chair, may I respond? No, Mr. Bersades. This is you, a parliamentarian, please. Yes, if our parliamentarian yes. could please respond. Mr. Bersades. The motion to call the question needs to be made verbally uh, so that the public can hear it before it can be processed. And, and thank asked, you. And that is exactly what I did when Madam Chair called on me. We are expected to put motions in chat, which I did. And when I was acknowledged, I made it verbally for the public. Thank you. Okay. So I'm 
because I, I think it's it's a little bit back and forth because it's it was in the chat and then when I when you said you called the question then you said that Miss Causey was before you and then that Miss Joes and so they asked their questions so right now is it an appropriate time then for her to call the question does it need to be restated Mr. Mercedes. Uh, if for nothing else, for clarity's sake, if Ms. Hen would like to repeat her motion. But, but others have, are waiting in line to ask questions and comment. And others were waiting in line to ask questions and comments, but um, I guess what I'm wondering is Ms. Hen's calling of the question was before those other uh, questions came up. Yes, I, I think it's appropriate to process Ms. Hen's motion now. Okay. So, Ms. Hen, if you would restate your motion. I call the question. Okay. Does it require a second? Yes. Is there a second? Second, Matt. Okay. So the question was called and seconded. So now we can vote on calling the question, which would end debate. So if you want debate to end, you vote yes. If you would like to continue, you vote no. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Ra? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is six. So it does not pass. It requires Correct. seven to pass. Okay. So um, actually, uh, calling the question requires eight. Requires two thirds. Okay, great. So we can go ahead. Looks like the next question is from Mr. Mahomza. I, I had stepped out when. Sorry. Um, Mr. Mahomza, we're having some trouble hearing you. Sorry. Can you, yeah. Yeah, okay. I had Thank stepped you. out when I believe Dr. Hager was asking her questions. And she mentioned um, a deadline, I believe it was May 18th. Is that the last day any schedule or like learning program can change? We have May 10th for one group of students and then May 17th for one group of students. And as we have done before, I think if there is still available space um, we can work with our individual schools if that's what you're talking about. No, no, no. Like, um, I think the, I think what she was talking about, like after May 18th, not, like they can't change, uh, like bringing in new groups, can't change schedules, stuff like that. Is did I understand that correctly? No, Josh. I, I meant, um, I meant that it's the last like big change in our reopening plan, like the next um, milestone. Is all I meant. Okay. I apologize for making my. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and um, a lot of uh, other board members brought up that um, some schools were offering four days to, and these are secondary schools, four days to all students. Uh, is that correct? Um, that some schools that were offering that to all students, not just the selective, selected students? Again, School leaders are looking and providing um, extensive outreach to students. So if there's some information that our community superintendents need so they can follow up, I'm not sure. Uh, every school is different and every situation is different. So the more outreach and more interest we can provide, but we still have to look at our constraints, particularly at secondary. So, you know, I will say if there's some additional information that our community superintendents and I need to have to follow up, please share that. But every school is going to be different in how and what their setup will look like at the secondary level. Sorry, I'm a little confused. So it's possible that some schools could allow all students who um, desire to come in for there's some in there's possibility that schools can continue to open up and add more students, yes. Okay. Uh, the issue is all, because of the circumstances of every school, because of the data that's driving these decisions, because of the outreach, to make it all, we may not be able to accommodate all interests 
at this time. It's really a school by school situation. Okay. All right. Those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we had Ms. Pestor. Yes, I want to go back to uh, Dr. Hager's comment and Joshua's question, because maybe I'm confused. This is to you, Dr. Williams. If the numbers do a change, uh, Ms. Somerville said that they have not dropped precipitously, but and that might not happen. But is May 18th your, the drop dead date for this system, regardless of what the numbers might show after the 18th, in terms of whether you would then amend from a few in here, there, whatever, to a full, just bring them back for four days? Is the 18th it, just based on the calendar or whatever you're basing it on, even if the numbers change? Based on what we know now, May 18th is it. We have been, the feedback is let us, let the schools do the outreach, let them bring back as many students as possible and let us finish out the school year. So we were looking at May 18th being it. So you didn't put a cap for the schools. The schools were able to figure out how many they could safely bring in, knowing that now we're doubling up in the halls, et cetera. Yeah, it's almost like each school has its own ratio or equation based on what they know, what's happening, and based on interest to try to figure out how many more students they could bring back. Yes, in terms of moving them, teaching them, the whole nine yards. Thank and, you. And, and keep in mind, mm -hmm. the secondary is different from elementary. They are not cohorted at the secondary. Oh. So as Dr. Roberts mentioned, we also have to look at the common areas in terms of oh, where yeah. kids are gathering, lunch, sure. et cetera. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like there's a question from or a comment from Ms. Mack. Ms. Mack? Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I was muted. I'm sorry. Um, I'm inclined to support this motion, number one, because it gives a choice and it does not mandate that all students have to come back. The other um, reason I'm inclined to support it is, while I haven't had conversation with many middle school teachers, I have had quite a bit of conversation with high school teachers who have told me that many of their classes have maybe two kids in the class um, on the, the, like the Monday, Tuesday, or the Thursday, Friday. Um, initially, when we had, had kids return, some of the kids returned to school, um, there was some interest, but that interest has dropped off. So I'm wondering if we're even gonna have the, the number of kids that we think we're gonna have um, oh, I'm so, I'm sorry, Dr. Hager. If do you want me to stop and let Dr. Hager go, um, Miss Scott? No, no, no. Keep going. Keep you can, going, Lisa. Uh, excuse okay. me. Yeah, um, you can go ahead, and then um, I'm sorry, I skipped over you, Dr. Hager. Um, so if it's okay, Miss Hen, can she go after Miss Mack? Yes, my question was asked. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Please can, go ahead, Miss Mack. Teachers have expressed to me that they don't even know if a number of students will come back because there seems to be a lagging interest in kids returning to school. Again, I don't have that insight for middle schools, but I have had a lot of conversation with high school teachers. So just a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. And now, uh, Dr. Hager. Um, I, I just want to say that I, I would, in theory, love to support this motion. I personally have one kid that I would love to see back in four days a week more than you can imagine. It's exactly what that child needs. Um, and that child's school is not opening it up to everyone. Um, and, you know, again, that, that as a parent, that would really be great for, for my own child situation. But I am deeply concerned about the, the rates are still high. Um, we're not there. And I know it is guidance and not, you know, hard and fast line in the sand. Um, but we're, we're really not even close to the point where we could be at three feet for middle and high school. And there may be some middle and high schools where it's really crowded. Um, and so I, you know, I, I would hope that as the school year unfolds, and I know that it's for coming up to the end, um, that there may be opportunities for, for more children to, to slowly come back as our numbers go down. But I just, um, I just don't think we're there yet. And, and again, I, I would love, love, love to support this, but I do worry about uh, the transmission rates and we're so close to a vaccine for our 12 to 15 year olds, maybe, maybe even next week. So um, I just sadly can't support this, but I, I, I want it so badly, but I just can't support it. So that's all. 
Thank you, Dr. Hager. Looks like there's a comment from Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I just wanted to point out that we're talking about the 18th um, and the following week, all the seniors are going to be gone. They're graduating. Um, so we're going to actually reduce the population in the high schools by one fourth. Uh, so I'm going to support this because I think it is manageable. I think we're putting it in the parent and the student's hands. I have students in high school and middle school, and I know that um, you know, my own children are excited to be back in school, but there's been limited uptake, uh, especially in the high school, of people coming in. So I don't honestly think this is going to be a problem, and I want people to have the opportunity. That's all I'm voting for. Thank you. Thank you for that. And um, I just would, I had a, um, I guess a question, um, this motion um, that was made, was this, um, I guess it would be for you, um, Mr. McMillian, um, what was this based off of? Um, was there a specific statistic or study or, or something that was done or research or information that you received that precipitated this? I've been engaged in conversation with a couple of high school teachers, administrators, mm -hmm. and it sounds like the, the number of kids that actually said they're coming back, and I'll give you an example, uh, two different situations I was told, 40% said they were coming back, and then so out of that, you know, let's just say 400 kids said they were coming back, in reality, they came in, showed their face, and they were gone. Uh, that 400 went down to 180 to 200 real quick. Mm -hmm. So, and, and another situation, I got involved in, a, in another conversation, it's the same kind of thing. So kids, teenagers are coming in, seeing the situation, and because it's not the old way, and they can't hang out with their friends, and they have to be socially distanced, that they, they're making the decision that they're not coming in. So they are in actual limbo between the in-person and the virtual. Okay. So it, it just sounds to me like there's room in these school buildings that, you know, for, for more students to enter. Thank okay. You. And um, Dr. Williams, my question for you would be, are there any comparable systems of um, the same size of VCPS that are open four days a week or, or doing what? Is, like, is there any precedence for this? Well, keep in mind, we're the third largest in the state of Maryland and larger than Baltimore County is Prince George's and Montgomery County. Now, there are the, some of the smaller districts that may not have had the number of cases nor the number of deaths, and have figured out if you're looking at one or two secondary schools. But I, I, I want to comment what Mr. McMillian just said. That's the importance of allowing the school leadership teams and the principals to do that outreach. If they have the space, if students say they're not coming, let the school teams reach out to those parents or those parents to reach out to them and say, I know you have the space, I want to come in. And, and let the school leadership teams make that decision. We're, we're, by making all, every school is different. That just cannot happen. But to give the leadership of the, of the school principal and the school team to make those informed decisions, we just talked about community involvement, allow them to talk to their parents and figure it out. I've been to schools. I've talked to some senior officers. I've seen the space. And the principal said, Dr. Williams, we're inviting more kids because like you said, students have decided this might not be for me. I'm good where I am. We got several weeks left. It is really a school by school situation. That's why we have executive directors. That's why we have community superintendents. That's why we've been working with our unions. I think it is a school decision if they have the space to continue to invite more students back. Um, we, the issue, once again, where we are now, which is different from elementary, the secondary is, is, is a different way in which we schedule. Allow the schools to make those decisions to work with their communities and work with their families to constantly bring back more students. I, I just think it's, we cannot do all. We, we just cannot do all 
based on the circumstances and based on the guidelines and based on the restrictions. I think it's important that you allow the school leadership teams and the principals to do what they have been doing, to continue that outreach and to support their families the best they can so we can continue this year and then begin additional rebuilding as we look at our summer and look at the fall starting of the school year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And it looks like there's an amendment from Ms. Causey. Am I reading that correctly, Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I am, I am going to make a motion to amend as capacity for their school can allow all COVID safety protocols to be implemented. Capacity will be determined by the school leadership. Communication will be system-wide and school-wide. Um, is there a second? Did someone say second? Could you say it, Josh, so we can hear? Can't hear you. Second. Okay, that amendment was seconded by Mr. Mahomza. Um, but where um, I would ask Ms. Causey, where is it that language going in? Is that going in at the end of the motion? Yes, ma'am, it's going in at the end of the motion. And if I could just um, comment, speak to my motion. Um, I, I hear uh, all of the conversation that's been happening and <clears throat> I agree with the pivots and the changes. And I um, you know, heard about if the numbers go down, can we add more later? And I do think at this point in the year, there needs to be, uh, unfortunately, this late in the year, a hard stop. Um, and I do want to make it clear that board members agree that uh, the safety protocols need to be implemented. That, that's not a question. Of course, safety is the priority, but we also understand that there are that it is inequitable to have an opportunity that is not even communicated to uh, all parents and all students. So this is about equity. This is about uh, providing for each student what they need and just giving the, the student and their parent an opportunity to communicate to the principals and the leadership, uh, maybe their counselors, that yes, this is something that's going to help them, not just this year, but as Mr. McMillian pointed out, as a teacher of over 30 years, to get ready for the summer, to get ready for uh, the fall. Uh, we have, as Dr. Williams said, recovery and rebuilding to do. And many parents and students want to start now. Okay. Oops. Okay, thank you. So it looks like there's some questions specifically to the amendment. Um, so we'll get those answered so we can process this. Dr. Hager? I just feel like that's this is what they're already doing. This is the approach that's being undertaken right now where secondary schools are allowed to bring back the number of students that meet their capacity, and they're doing it in their own way. Um, so I, I just don't quite understand how this amendment is different than what's happening right now. Thank you, Dr. Hager, and, for your question. Um, the difference what, is, I sorry, talked Dr. To Hager, did you have a question? I think she was just making a, a statement. I, I don't think there was a, a question there. Well, I mean, if, if Ms. Causey has, has an answer, then, then that's great. But uh, yeah, I, that's my, my viewpoint. But, but yeah, if you would like to respond. No, I, I've been hearing from um, students and parents and even teachers that there's additional um, uh, students that want to be considered for this educational opportunity. And by not having communications, and I'm, I'm not going to put this on the uh, schoolhouse leadership, uh, I had said this at the last meeting that there needed to be communication system-wide as to what is the process and that it needed to be equitable and it needed to be fair and it needed to be clear, not a, a, a person wondering why a student in one family uh, is going to one school, but their other child has not even been considered. Uh, so that's not clear communication. We all heard our stakeholders commenting on the policy 1270 and community engagement. We need to improve. And this is one way that we can do it immediately and help our students. Okay, next is Ms. Rowe. So I guess what I'd like to know from school system staff, because this isn't really clear to me, is the way that we're intending to do it right now. 
how are we deciding which students, aside from the special education students, how are we deciding which other students come back? Is it a lottery? Is it what happens if more people are interested in coming back than we can fit? Or are we hand selecting people? What is the selection process? So I'll, hi, good evening, Ms. Rowe. Um, I can start and then any of my colleagues can jump in. Um, as we've stated, the outreach is really based, and I believe Dr. Robert said this earlier, on um, an ongoing review of student data. So every day there's teaching, there's data that's collected on how students are performing. And so our school leaders and their leadership teams are looking at the data. They're looking at their school needs. They're looking at their school progress planning goals. And they're using all of that in order to make decisions about um, adding additional students who would benefit from the face-to-face -face opportunity. Again, our reopening plan was always designed to meet the needs of our neediest students. That's equity, that's the policy, is giving students what they need. And so schools are using the data that they have, that daily classroom data, in order to make these decisions. It's not one specific thing across all schools because that wouldn't be equity because every school population is different. The students that make up that school are different. And so this is really um, leaders and leadership teams being responsive to their data. So are we going to fill each school to the maximum capacity allowed by COVID safety procedures? But like, I guess my question is, so if we have data and we've identified students based on data, and I don't have a problem with giving opportunities to the media students first, but if there are more available seats past that even, are those seats intended to be opened up for other students at will? I, I, I can say that when leaders were going through this process, they, that's what they took into account when they were identifying students. They took into account their capacity. And when we say capacity, again, it becomes complicated. Um, but they were looking at their capacity from a CDC guideline standpoint. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Hen. And um, yes, we're, question, we're asking questions on the specific amendment because that's what we'll need to vote on. Okay, so my comment was along the lines of what Dr. Hager had shared. I think this is what we're currently doing by allowing school leadership teams to determine um, which students they're bringing back. So I don't see the need for this amendment and won't be supporting it. Um, my comment on the original motion had to do with equity. And as a board, we're committed to the success of all students. And all means all. Ms. Hen, we're not and discussing the motion. We're discussing the amendment. Okay, next, Mr. Mahomza. Back to me to speak to the motion. I, Mr. Mahomza? Yeah, the reason I seconded the amendment was similar to what Dr. Hager was saying. Um, it seems like that was what you were talking about, Dr. Williams. So what is your feelings on the, mo uh, the amendment, if you don't mind me asking? I see it as this is the work of our school leaders, our leaders who have been working all year, our teachers who've been working all year, all of our staff. And as I visit schools, principals are saying, we, we're gonna figure out how to get more students back, but we gotta be safe. And so as the example that was shared tonight, and we've seen this, families have decided, you know, I want to be a part of cohort A or cohort B, and then things change. So there may be some more space available. The principals are working through and working with their families. And if there's some situations that our community superintendents need to be aware of, we're happy to work with our principals. But I think this is really saying what the principals and leadership teams are doing. Mm -hmm. and, and so, we started with several groups and we want to expand as much as possible as well as 
maintain what we are currently in this state with the CDC guidelines. So it's, it is the work that our schools are doing. And I believe, and I know our principals are dedicated in trying to get more students back um, because they miss their kids just like the staff miss their kids. And so this is the work that we're doing. This is the work that the individual schools are doing. Yeah. Um, at times, like it's hard as board members to um, know where uh, you're crossing the lines from operations. Um, and would you see this as crossing that line in your opinion? In it's my opinion? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Those are more comments. Thank you. Next is Ms. Pastor. It has been stated twice, so thank you. This just seems like what he, Dr. Williams already said. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And um, we, we do need to process, because it is, um, we are, very much behind time, so we do need to process this amendment and process this motion. Um, and I'm trying to see if everyone has spoken who has a question or a comment. It looks like it's Miss Jose and then Mr. McMillian. Miss Scott, I can skip if we're voting. Um, everything that I need to ask has already been asked in the interest of time. If we get to vote, that's fine. Thanks. Okay. Um, Mr. McMillian? To, to me, this emphasizes the breakdown of communication. I specifically ask for a list of schools that were implementing this to the max. And I didn't get it. And, uh, and then I added by area. I think it would be extremely interesting to look at the the middle and, and high school students in the respective areas and see which schools are allowing this and which aren't. And then I actually have a quote that says most of the secondary schools can, can, can accommodate requests. So, you know, there just seems like some people are letting them in and, and I, you know, I'd like to, you know, I, I try to respect the decision of leadership to do the right thing. Uh, but, you know, most of the secondary schools can accommodate requests. And that's a pretty serious quote to me. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I wanted to make sure I gave Ms. Hen an opportunity. To speak to the motion or amendment? The motion as a... Oops. Well, the amendment or the motion as amended? I have a comment on the original motion. when we get to that. Okay, we have to, all right then. Um, all right, so are we ready to vote on this? Because we do uh, need to process this. Let's see. Madam Chair, I had put in the chat before, uh, <clears throat> prior that I uh, wanted to speak just one last time. Uh, so I'm sorry, uh, from... Ms. Causey, excuse me. It looks like Ms. Mack is above you. It looks like she has a question for Mr. McMillian and then yours is after hers. Thank Ms. you. Yes, Ms. My Matt? question for Mr. McMillian is if the school system would commit to providing you with the school level data that you requested um, by the end of the week. Well, then I'm, I'm sorry, then we're running out of time. Uh, never mind. We're, we'll be the next time we meet, we'll be at that date. So never mind. OK, and yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you. And and as to. Um, the board and board members staying in their lane, I would first suggest that this is a pandemic. There is nothing normal about this year. There is nothing tried and true about this year. So this is not normal. There is gray area. Policy 1270 states the Board of Education recognizes that parents, guardians, families, and communities must collaborate to support academic achievement, ensuring that every student is prepared for college and or career opportunities. Then on policy 0100, where we direct the superintendent to implement the policy of 100 equity. Um, <clears throat> that the um, accountability definition, ensuring processes and procedures do not reproduce inequity opportunities. 
the fact is, is that data does not necessarily tell the whole story of a child or that student's needs or the student's and the family's needs for their education. So unless there is school-wide or community-wide communication as to what the process is, then it is not equitable. Because um, as much as our very, uh, you know, experienced and caring school leadership are, they haven't seen a lot of these children in a year. They haven't seen the parents. So it, really, it's asking for communication to the parents and students to understand that this opportunity is available given parameters, parameters of safety, uh, and, and ensuring that policies are implemented is the role of the board. Thank you. So now if we could um, vote on this amendment. Ms. Calzy made a motion to amend the main motion as, as capacity for their school can allow all COVID safety protocols to be implemented. Capacity will be determined by the school leadership. Communication will be system-wide and school-wide. And it was seconded by Mr. Mahomza. So we're voting on the amendment. Um, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pester? No. Mr. Kuhn? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is four. Okay. So that's the amendment. And the now we will um, take a vote on the main motion. And the Madam, motion which... Excuse me? May I speak to the motion now? Yes, please. Go ahead. Ben? So going back to my comments, and we've talked a lot tonight about equity and what is or isn't equitable, for us to offer the opportunity to return, for all students at some schools to return and not others, is not equity. So I will be supporting Mr. McMillian's motion um, because as a parent, I appreciate the opportunity for my own student to return, and all students should have that same opportunity. All means all. And if we believe in equity, we will support Mr. McMillian's motion. Thank you. Okay. If we can process that motion, please. A motion was made by Mr. McMillian to move that all BCPS middle school and high school leadership teams provide all general education grades 6 through 12 students slash families the option to return to four-day in person instruction starting on Monday, May 17th, 2021. And that was seconded by who? Was Mr. Kuhn. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Seconded by Mr. Kuhn. So, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is five. Okay. Oh, thank you, Ms. Gover. So that um, motion did not pass. So Madam Chair, um, I'm going to call the division just to I, understand. Well, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I, I'm sorry, uh, board members, if we could... Um, wait to be recognized so that we're not speaking over each other. Um, so we're, um, that motion did not pass. So was there someone who needed to be recognized and had a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's Ms. Causey. I'm requesting divisions. I was on the chat, Ms. Scott. Okay. All right. So that, yes. So, so that we could have some semblance of order because it is getting late and I want to make sure that we're not going over anyone. If um, you could put your name in the chat, if you have a comment, and then um, so that I can recognize you. So um, it looks like it's Miss Jose and then Miss Causey. 
Yes, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I would like to call for orders of the day, please. Oh, okay. Orders of the day. Um, it is 938. So then based on orders of the day, our meeting would be over. <laughs> Mr. Mercedes, could you please weigh in on that? Does the orders, calling for the orders of the day, does um, that require a second? No, uh, it's not. No. Does not require a second, not debatable, not amendable. So then calling for orders of the day would basically mean that our meeting is over. You could move on to the next agenda item. Is that appropriate, Mr. Mercedes? Because I thought, moment. Yeah, okay, because I, as I understood it, when you call for orders of the day, you go to the time um, and it's 9.39, and so the orders of the day, if we were adhering to that, um, would mean that the meeting is over. Madam Chair, if we could have Ms. Well, Callie, I'm sorry, excuse uh, me. If we could um, wait to... Madam Chair? I, that's what we're getting from Mr. Bersades right now. He's, he's checking on that so that we can process one thing at a time. Um, the orders of the day were called, and so that's not debatable and doesn't require a second. And it's not amendable. So, um, thank you, Madam Chair, for considering that, that the orders of the day would mean that our meeting was over. Um, either Mr. Bersades or Ms. Howie, if you're there, if either of you could weigh in on that to um, um, supply us with guidance, please. Don't we have to vote on it? No, it's not no. debatable. So, when someone calls orders of the day is not debatable. So you do not have to vote on it. It is um, done on the request of a single member. So if the orders of the day were called, we have some background. Excuse me. On excuse, this. excuse me. If the orders of the day were called and it's nine forty, and our agenda does not go up until nine forty, our agenda was set to end at eight fifty. Then um, what does that mean for the rest of our meeting? As I indicated, the uh, call for orders of the day is a call to follow the established agenda. So the, the established agenda items uh, that continue to remain, you can move on to your next agenda item. The assembly can also, by a two-thirds vote, uh, indicate that it does not want to follow the orders of the day. Okay, so I can move on to um, the next um, agenda item, which would be new business contracts, which would be item M. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we do not abide by orders of the day. Okay. And does that motion require a second? It would. Is there a second? Second. Okay. That sounds like it was seconded by Mr. McMillian. And to overturn that would require two-thirds vote. To Is over this debatable? No. Calling the Calling the orders of the day is not debatable, but if there's a motion made to overturn, I guess, calling the orders of the day would require two-thirds votes. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote then, please. Ms. Excuse Rob? me, Madam Chair. Point of information, I'm still not clear. So my motion is not deba debatable? No, as I understand it. You called... You made a point to overturn the um, decision to call for orders of the day, and then it was seconded. So then we would vote on that, on not moving to the next agenda item, and still staying in the reopening of schools discussion. As I understand that correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Um, Ms. Howie. Madam Chair. I'm sorry, excuse me, I asked for Ms. Howie to correct me if I'm incorrect, or Mr. Mercedes. You stated it correctly. Okay, the thank you. Assembly can now vote on whether or not they wish to follow the orders of the day. So, so basically, by two thirds mm -hmm. majority, the assembly can proceed, can continue with the discussion and the current agenda item. Okay, but if it's not two thirds, then we move on to the next agenda item. Okay, Ms. Gover, if we could start our roll call vote, please. 
Please Can someone out. clarify what yes or no means <laughs> right now? So it's yes. Okay. Continue the meeting well, or so no. yes. If you vote yes, well maybe I should let Miss Howie um, explain it because she'll probably do a much better job than I will. <laughs> Thank you. So a vote in the affirmative, which is yes, then, which would be a vote yes based on the motion that is on the floor, would be a vote not to abide by the orders of the day. So you would continue with the, your current discussion and not go on to the next agenda item. So I'll, I can simplify that. If you vote yes, then we stay on the discussion of the reopening of schools, item L. If you vote no, then you're voting to move on to item M, which is new business, so that we can process our agenda. Does anyone else have any more questions? Is that clear? Madam Chair, it's not clear. This is Ms. Hen. <laughs> Why aren't we voting on the original motion that was on the floor prior to Ms. Causey's motion to overturn? So when you call for orders, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. Howie. When there is a call for the orders of the day that is uh, can be called on by any one member of the assembly, and it must be followed. If, however, as Ms. Causey has done, is effectively a motion to set aside the orders of the day, then the motion to set aside the orders of the day would then mean that you no longer uh, follow the agenda. You would continue with the discussion as you have been. You would not go on to the next agenda item. That requires a two-thirds vote to set aside the orders of the day. Thank you. So calling the question requires a vote because that's a motion, but calling the orders of the day does not because that's not a motion? It is a motion, but it's a motion with different characteristics. So I think I saw in the, the chat uh, a motion for division. A motion for division, for example, is called upon by any single member. It is not debatable and it does not require a second. So that's the, it's the same characteristics that a motion for a call for orders of the day has. Okay, so if we could take a vote, please, so that we could move on. Um, yes means that you, I'll, I'll repeat it again. Yes means that we would stay on item L. A no means that you would move on to item M, new business. Is that correct, Ms. Howie? Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Hope that's clear for everyone. If we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is seven. And it needed two thirds to be overturned, is that correct? Which would be eight? Correct. correct. Okay, thank you. So then we're moving on then now to item M, which is new business contract awards. And excuse me, for Mr. that, Chair, ex excuse me, yes. Who was speaking, I, please? This is Mr. Keene. I, I put in a, a, something in the chat for a question before we, we, we took that vote. I'm, I'm just trying to understand something um, about um, whatever it is. Just that just move, is moving us forward. Does this mean that because we are still following the agenda, we're just late, right? Yes. So does does this mean that we're supposed to just move one agenda item, or does this mean we're supposed to move to the actual time in our agenda that has been set forth and planned by by you, which in essence ends the meeting? I I don't I don't understand why. I mean, we were following the agenda. Yes. So. so, okay. So, um, calling the orders of the day, as I understand it, um, moves you to the agenda item to the time in the agenda. And Ms. Howie, please again, because she's the expert in this, correct me. Um, or you can move to the next agenda item. But it's not debatable 
and it um, it's usually moves the meeting along so that you can stay within time parameters. Ms. Howie, do you have anything to add to that, or was that a pretty correct assessment? No, ma'am. Okay. That was correct. And I have, um, we have a Robert's Rules of Order book, and I believe it's, um, if I had my book, I would tell everybody what page it is on so that we could review that, and um, as well as I have something that I can send out um, that talks more about um, parliamentary procedure and the different rules and, and, and what different things mean and, and how they work. Oh, thank you for that, Dr. Hager. It's on page 128 um, of your um, Robert's Rules of Order um, book. So, Thank you. Thank you for those questions. So um, the next item on the agenda is contract awards. And for that, I call on Ms. Joes, Chair of the Building and Contracts Committee. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, members of the board, the Building and Contracts Committee met this afternoon and reviewed contracts one through six. The Building and Contracts Committee recommends approval of contracts one through six. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, do Madam I have Chair, a motion to... Ms. Quasi, I was wondering if we could separate the contracts. You want to separate all six contracts out? Are there particular ones you'd like to separate out, or do you want them all separated out? Um, I, I think it would probably just be easier to have them all separated out. <laughs> okay. All right, so... The first one is uh, JBO 710-21, Temporary Adult Assistant and Therapeutic Behavioral Aids. Um, are there any questions or discussions on that? Okay. So do I have a motion to approve item M1, JBO 710-21, Temporary Adult Assistance and Therapeutic Behavioral Aids? So I moved off me. Thank you. Sounds like it was so moved by Mr. Offerman. All right. Um, the next one, and I'm just going in order here, is um, M2. I'm sorry, I'm trying to make sure I don't miss anybody in chat. Um, CWA-131-20, modifications, technical support to implement a community school strategy. And... Oh, I apologize. Sorry. There was a motion for the first one. I'm sorry. We need to do a roll call vote. Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Abstain. <laughs> Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hem? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. And now um, we can discuss M2CWA-131-20, modification technical support to implement a community school strategy. And questions on that, I, I believe first we have Ms. Mack and then Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, my question, I have a number of questions on this. Where can the board and the public find the list of current community schools and which schools will be added as a result of this contract in both FY21 and FY22? Uh, this is Mr. Saris. The, the list uh, is available in the uh, blueprint for Maryland legislation, um, HB 1372, and uh, I will be happy to um, send that, share that with the superintendent so that uh, all, so that that's public. Um, the threshold is a 75% uh, farms threshold. Uh, when the bill was first established for FY20, that was set at 80%. Um, and now uh, for FY21, that was lowered, adding six schools. And for FY22, 
uh, 11 more will be added. So, Mr. Saris, thank you for that information. Um, but you mentioned the farms rates, and we have schools who are not using where they qualify for CEP. How does this impact the selection of schools where we don't no. have a farms rate? MSD has made that determination for us. So uh, I'm not sure what information they've used and how they've applied it, but it's set forth in the legislation. Okay, and then my other questions have to do with what job titles does this contract encompass, which bargaining unit would those job titles be in? And when um, I see that we're looking at using contractors and we were provided information in the weekly update, or I'm sorry, yes, that Mr. Kuhn had asked a question, um, that we would look to be moving towards permanent employees. And what is our timeline for moving towards permanent employees as opposed to contractors? Well, the position, the community school liaison uh, for which there'll be one at each school is essentially a social worker position in the TABCO bargaining unit. And we, we will actively recruit for those positions. And based on the success, uh, if we're unable to fill all the positions, we would then uh, use the Y Central Maryland YMCA contract for interim services until such time as we can fill the positions with regular employees. But our intention is to fill it with regular full-time employees and fall back on contractors if needed? Yeah. Yes. And we've also used the contractor to help us with some visioning and strategic development, meetings with the communities and so forth. Uh, but the positions are planned to be regular appointments. Thank you very much, Mr. Saris. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you. And next looks like we have a question from Ms. Quasi. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Ms. Mack asked some of my questions, and thank you, Mr. Saris, for your answers. Um, the other uh, question I had is, um, can you define the position of um, community school liaison? Well, um, I'm going to see if that was included in our uh, response to some of Mr. Kuhn's questions, and then I'll defer uh, the uh, to climate and safety. Uh, the community school liaison is responsible for a broad range of interrelated responsibility responsibilities, which include engaging and supporting families, securing and maintaining community partnerships integrating eligible services into the school community and ensuring that students are participating. The community school liaison will work with staff, student, students, families, and community organizations to foster a school environment that is consistently welcoming to families, respects and honors student and family diversity within the school community and draws upon family and community resources to enhance teaching and learning this position will facilitate and participate in the community school advisory board meetings. Thank you for that. That sounds very important. Um, and certainly after the year we've had, our schools are going to need um, all the support they can for our students. Um, can you um, also tell me the grants? Uh, it says that the budget is coming from uh, grants. Which ones? And yes. The I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah, this is the uh, Concentration of Poverty Grant. COP is the acronym. Uh, the initial grant in FY20 was $995,000. The FY21 grant was increased to just under $1.5 million um, uh, for a total of 2.5. 
And in FY22, that grant goes to $5.2 million. So it will, it's, an, it's now embedded in the foundation program as an ongoing um, grant. It is restricted um, and it's a central part of the blueprint now. Okay, thank you for that. And is there any prohibition to um, the school system hiring staff from the vendors? Uh, in other words, if if we have experience with a Y employee, can we ultimately uh, hire them as a regular FTE? Yes. I don't know. Um, if how if or how that is addressed in the contract, um, my my guess would be that it's not prohibited, but we would have to uh, look at the details of that contract, which was uh, has been in place since 2020. Okay, thank you. And my last question is: the um, Office of Internal Audit routinely. Um, audit certain grants. Um, is this one of the grants that is already on their rotational schedule, or is this um, something different? Um, I don't believe this is is one of the grants that they plan to audit now. Um, that might be something we can talk about when we get to their third quarter or I don't know if they're present for that third quarter report, but this grant will be, uh, MSD has already advised us that they have accelerated their, uh, their audit um, cycle to account for these additional blueprint grants. And so um, we expect uh, them to be the primary auditor, just as they audit all the foundation grants every two years. Thank you. That's all I had. You're Thank welcome. Thank you. And it um, looks like we have another question. Um, Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? Le Oh, thank you. I, I was just asking to have the list of schools added to board docs for the public. I, I, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. I think uh, Ms. Jose is next. Okay. Thank you. It uh, looks like, uh, yes, Ms. Jose. Mm -hmm. I just have a comment so you can go to Ms. Pastor for her question and circle back to me. Thank you. Sorry, one moment. Sorry, passed you a technical problem. Uh, I just wanted to comment on what Mr. Sarah said. I was just going to point out that it is now an integral part of Kerwin. And if you all would take a look at the money uh, budget that I sent out of Kerwin last week, you will see that it is included there. I sent you in my May report all of the funding out of that. and. That's my point. So it is well covered. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. And now we can go back to you, Ms. Jose. I just want to make a quick comment that um, these contracts, and there's only six, are posted well in advance for all board members a week. And Mr. Kuhn did take advantage of that opportunity and send in um, about 27, 28 questions, and they were all answered by staff on Friday. And I believe, Ms. Gower, correct me if I'm wrong, you have added them to the executive content of board uh, board uh, docs. And so, you know, board members don't have to filibuster the main session. The committees are formed to do the work of the board. I don't mind answering some of the questions, but to have do the work of the committee in the full assembly is not time effective or efficient. Uh, so I would really appreciate it if board members could take a couple of minutes, look at the contract and send questions to staff for answering. That would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, Ms. Joseph, I could just ask the question, how long were, I, I think you said it, but how long were these contracts posted in board docs um, or, or prior to your meeting in advance of your meeting? A week before the meeting, at least. 
So they were posted for seven days, and you're saying, like, Mr. Kuhn, all board members could have... What would their options have been, I guess, as opposed to having it during the full assembly? Um, they could have emailed questions seven days in advance, or um, I believe it, uh, board members could also have attended your board meeting, I mean, your um, committee meeting. Would that be accurate okay. as well, and ask questions there? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, and so the third option then is to ask them during the time of the assembly. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a question from, looks like there's a quite a few. Um, Madam Chair. From, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to go in order to make sure that I get everybody. Um, it looks like there's a question from Ms. Rowe. I was going to request to yeah. be acknowledged because I had a comment in response to Ms. Joseph's. Excuse me. No, um, Ms. Ms. Hen, please. I, um, I want to make sure that we get to everybody and that we go in order and, and we are in an orderly fashion. So I have Ms. Rowe, then you. Ms. Rowe, if you would like to, please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Mr. Saris, would you just clarify for me that what we're doing here today is approving a contract for a service that is mandated that we perform by MSED, MSDE because of Kerwin, right? Correct. Okay, so the question is not, as a school system, do we need a community schools liaison? We are getting a community schools liaison one way or another. The question is, are we going to hire this vendor or not hire this vendor? Correct. I'm just trying to understand the implication of the decision because I'm ha there's no way that you can do community schools without a community schools liaison. So I'm having a hard time finding out why this is even an issue. But thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Thank you. And next now we have Ms. Hen. Thank you. So I just wanted to point out that um, the building and contracts committee meeting was moved up to, I believe, 1.30 today, precluding members um, of that committee from participating. So the full session is the only opportunity we've had, um, despite that meeting um, being held later um, beforehand. So with that um, in mind, I'd like to make the following motion. To conduct board business in a manner We're in the middle of a motion. I'm sorry, I have the floor. There's already a motion on the floor. Excuse me, board members. Now everyone is out of order. There's already a motion on the floor. The correct. There is not a motion on the floor, but because we need to excuse me. We're discussing contracts, so I, I apologize. There is not a motion on the floor, but we can't cross over and talk over each other and, and interrupt each other because then we're not able to properly process. So yes. Ms. Hen was making a motion. Please continue. Thank you. To conduct board business in a manner that is fully transparent and accessible to stakeholders, including and especially teachers, and to ensure that all board members have equal opportunity to fully participate in all meetings, I move that all weekday open session meetings of the board and all weekday open session meetings of all board committees begin no earlier than 5 p.m. Is there a second? Okay. And could we put that in the chat, please? Yes. Thank you. Is it in the chat? I'm still typing. It will be there momentarily. One second. Okay. Um, is it in the chat yet in the interest of time, Ms. Hen? There were some questions on it. I'm I'm finishing it up now. Okay. If we could, because it is 10 o'clock at night. Okay. And it looks like there's some questions to 
I'm just trying to look ahead. These questions are related to the motion made by Ms. Hen or these questions to, um, to the contract? Okay. The motion is now in the chat. Mom's okay. Chat. So Ms. Hen made a motion to conduct board business in a manner that is fully transparent and accessible to stakeholders, including and especially teachers, and to ensure that all board members have equal opportunity to fully participate in all meetings. I move that all weekday open session meetings of the board and all weekday open session meetings of all board committees begin no earlier than 5 p.m. And that was seconded by Mr. Kuhn. And Madam Chair, okay. I call the question. And you call the question, okay. So now we can vote on um, Ms. Hen calling the question. Does that require a second? Is there a second to the calling of the question? Second, Ken. Okay, the question has been called by Ms. Hen and seconded by Kuhn. So, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote, please, not on the motion, but on calling the question, which would essentially end debate, and then um, we would then vote on the motion. Um, Mr. Bersades, is does this require two-thirds? Because um, as I understand this motion, I just wanted to um, make sure we were clear before we vote, uh, the motion looks like it's 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 using um it's it's speaking in absolutes and it's saying all and it looks like it's all meetings for like now from now until perpetuity so considering that does this require a two-thirds vote for um i'm sorry not for the motion but for calling the question for calling the question requires two-thirds okay okay miss gover if we could do a question miss Rowe. yes Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. H uh, Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is six. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So the question um, did not pass. So now we can debate the motion. Um, then now I can ask the question that I was asking earlier to Mr. Persades before we get um, too far down. Um, is this something that should be done in our, because um, this looks like the working or the operating of the board. So this looks like something that would be done in our administrative function. Um, as a, as opposed to a to a motion, um, could you weigh in on that, please? If this motion is out of order, or if it's something that would be more appropriate for us to handle, like in our administrative function or something like that? Yes. Good evening. It, it, it's not out of order. It would be uh, handled under the standing rules provision of Robert's rules and uh, can pass with the majority vote. Thank you. You answered my second question. Okay. Okay, so I want to make sure I get all the questions in order. It looks like we first had um, a question to the motion from Ms. from Mr. Mahamza, Ms. Jose. And Madam Chair, may I speak to my motion? Yes, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, I've heard from many teachers, especially, who listen to our board meetings, who are fully engaged, who want to have a say in the governance of the school system, and it's their right to do so. Um, much of our work happens in committee. Um, the work needs to happen when teachers can participate, and certainly when all board members can participate. Um, the board is not a, a full-time paid position. Many of us have full-time jobs in addition to our service. We need to do the work at times when our stakeholders, especially our teachers, and certainly all board members can participate. Each board member has the same rights and privileges as another, and it has been precedent to hold meetings when possible, certainly open session meetings in the evenings, 
we, it is our goal and it's one of the board goals to be transparent and available to our community to include them in our decision making and to do so. And the county council has done that. They have moved their meetings later to accommodate citizens um, with participation in government. And we need to do the same. So I ask for your support of this motion. Thank you. Sorry. Next, Mr. Mahomza. Yes. Um, there's a lot of ironies in Miss um, Penn's motion and what she's saying. First, she uses the word transparent in her motion, but the first thing she does is call the question, so not even allow us to even comment on a change to the schedule, which is not transparent. Um, second, she says it, it includes teachers. Well, teachers are very ambiguous words. You said you spoke to teachers. Um, did the teachers union call for this? Was there a poll done on teachers on this? Like, how do we know that all teachers support this? Um, and so, and then you mentioned that um, to open committees to all members so it fits in their schedule. Well, I haven't seen a committee meeting go past five. The last legislative committee was four. PRC was around three or so. The CNI committee was like at two. So I, I didn't, I've never seen a committee that has went past five. So I don't know how this is making it more open. I, I think it is the contrary. It's going to limit what board members um, attend what uh, committee meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Next is Ms. Jose. Ms. Jose, you're muted. Oh, sorry. Again, my question, my concern with this motion, it's, it's so broad ended. Our committee meetings are always held at the discretion of each committee chair in discussion with staff availability and time and days and other resources. Um, Ms. Hen keeps talking about transparency, yet when she was chair of the Building and Contracts Committee for the past two years, she regularly held these meetings at 3.30 or 4 o'clock before our closed session at five. Um, so it is a bit hypocritical to now make that motion because I have been working full time for the entire time and committee meetings, including curriculum, uh, PRC was held during the day at two, three, and you know, we did our best. Secondly, I wanna make a, a statement that stakeholders, board members, staff, teachers can all view this meeting at their convenience, their convenience because they are recorded and public cannot participate in our committee meetings, um, but they can view and they can watch it any time they need. Uh, Montgomery County Public Schools, Anne Arundel County Public Schools, uh, Board of Education has one board meeting midday. And also does her motion include special meetings? To make this motion just because it's of personal inconvenience to you when you followed that same protocol for two years. Oops, excuse me. Uh, when I become chair, when Ms. Scott becomes chair, now all of a sudden you guys all have this uh, issues with the timing of meetings with uh, committee. It's not a point of order. Excuse you me. Like You're all out of order. Excuse me. me. Excuse me. Excuse me. We are all out of order. We are all out of order. Excuse me, board members, please. This is this is divulging into chaos. I understand it is the lateness of the hour. Um, a point of order was raised um, during Ms. Joseph's comments. I don't know who raised the point of order because the purpose of raising a point of order is to raise it and then to be acknowledged by the chair. And no one was acknowledged. So a point of order was raised. Who raised the point of order? Ms. Hen. Okay, what is the point? Excuse me, Ms. Hen. Excuse me, Ms. Hen. What is the reasoning for your point of order? That's what I was saying. My point of order is that Ms. Joes is in decorum for making inappropriate personal remarks directed at a single board member. We do not address each other individually. So, Ms. Hen, um, Ms. Joes was making her comments in regards to the motion that was made, and the motion was to take away the ability to set the time by the chair of each of the committees, and I did not see that that was a need for a point of order, but um, I understand what you're saying. Ms. Joes, did you have any additional comments, or were you finished with your comments? No, I'm done. I don't like to grandstand. I'm just making a statement that, you know, this was regularly held for the past five, six years at this time. So I, I find this motion extremely inappropriate. Thank you. Thank you. 
And was there another uh, person who had a question? It looks like um, uh, Miss. Um, excuse me. Um, we're trying to. I'm trying to make sure that everyone is having their questions answered. And we did not process the point of order. I'm challenging the chair's ruling on the point of order. Okay. So the point of order was raised. And you're challenging the chair's ruling because I don't believe the point was well taken. So you've raised your point of order and you're challenging the chair's ruling on the point of order. And um, Mr. Mercedes, could you please weigh in on that? Is that something that we would vote on, the challenge of the point of order? And then what would be the outcome of that? Uh a second is needed, it is debatable, it is not amendable, and requires a majority vote to overturn the chair's, to, uh, to appeal the chair's decision. Okay, so is there a second to Ms. Hen's point of order? Second row. Okay, it was seconded by Ms. Rowe. If we could um, vote on Ms. Hen's point of order, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Mick? <clears throat> yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is six. Okay, so the point, so the chair's decision is upheld. So it looks like, uh, were there any other questions? It looks like there's a comment from Ms. Rowe. Um, so, yes. My, I, un, I understand about committees being at different times because the public cannot participate in the committees and they can watch the videos. However, um, I do share some concerns that if committee meetings, if times are fluctuating or if they're changing or if they're different times all the time, we have at least maintained the standard that committee meetings will take place on a regular rotating cycle such that, you know, maybe um, if, a, if PRC is always Thursday at four, it's always like the fourth Thursday at four or whatever. So there's a rotating cycle that's predictable and board members who want to attend can have a work a schedule that they can work with. I do think that we've gotten away from that um, into a way where meetings are starting to be scheduled a bit more arbitrarily than they have in the past. And I do think that for our general open meeting, because the public does actively participate in that, we should maintain the historical standard of 630. Because I, in my daughter's 14, since she's been in public school, I have never seen a general meeting um, that's open to the public to speak start at any other time than 6.30. And so, I mean, in principle, I support this motion, but it's not worded in quite the right way. Okay. Next is Dr. Hager. Um, I just, uh, similar to what Ms. Rowe was just saying, didn't we vote last meeting on maintaining our general uh, meetings at 6.30 when we voted on the calendar? Didn't that pass last meeting? That was for the upcoming year. Right. So there, so that's already established. And I agree um, that that's the priority to make sure, because the public does participate in those meetings. And, you know, I also work full time, similar to what most, Ms. Jost was saying, the committee meetings are not meetings where the public actively participates and they're almost immediately posted for the video right on board docs. So, um, you know, as long as there is consistency, like Ms. Rose said, I just, I just don't, I don't feel that um, having everything at five o'clock, which actually I think is a greater inconvenience for, for individuals with families who also work full time um, overall in the, in the grand scheme um, is, is a good idea. And, and again, given that we made this decision last meeting already, it just doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense to move forward with this, in my opinion. Thank you. It looks like, um, and I want to make sure we get everybody in there. Um, Ms. Pistor, are you raising your hand? Did you have a comment? I was asking. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I, I want to speak particularly to the part of the committees. 
uh, when we got on this board, a uh, couple of the dates were set, a couple of the dates were changed by committee discussion. I use curriculum and instruction, which started at 4.30, and a member of the committee asked to have it started earlier, and the committee agreed to that, and that's how we have been moving these things along. So for about, um, in most cases, about two years, or at least a year and a half, um, we have been stable in, in terms of this. I worry that this is, as Ms. Scott said, taking this, in terms of the wording, into perpetuity forever, or whatever the word is, I can't see the motion at the moment. And so we are making a, um, uh, a change that will impact other boards when decisions about committees and their times have been relegated as p to the committee as part of uh, what they do. So now we're asked to change to five, which means everyone has to change all of their schedules because uh, we now have to start at five when we've not been doing that. I just find it cumbersome and uh, unconscionable just to ask people to have to make that choice. And we have not really had a, a discussion about that. We all have lives beyond the board. So to start at five o'clock puts us seven o'clock. And that means now we're talking different days because on the day of CNI, we also have equity. Mm -hmm. So if uh, curriculum starts at 5 o'clock, then we will start equity at 7 o'clock, which means we'll be finished about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mrs. Pastor. Uh, next, it is Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. When I was the chair of the audit committee, the first thing I did was set the time to start after 6 p.m. since I work full time. Um, that's the only way I could manage that committee. Um, so I understand the challenge of, of trying to attend committees, um, even to watch the committees. Um, I, I, I work full time. I, I can't watch them during the day. So um, I don't want this to be based on me. I'm just sharing that it's challenging and I'm a work and, and I'm a parent. And my expectation would be most parents uh, that if they wanted to follow a committee, for instance, and they should, especially the curriculum, because that's directly associated with what your children are going to see and what we are going to be providing them over the long term, they should be active in those committees. They should understand what is happening there. Uh, so I, I support uh, this action. Um, it sounds like that it may not be supported across the board, uh, but I just wanted to speak out to say that I think that it's possible to do this. Uh, it may be a little challenging um, because people are used to, you know, doing things during the day. Um, but um, I, I think that it does uh, allow for um, more people to actually watch them. So that's my goal in supporting this. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Next, we have Ms. Mack. Um, yes, I just wanted to speak to Dr. Hager's motion about the action that we took in the last meeting about regular meeting starting at 6.30. We took that same action last year. Um, so we had a motion that meet, regular meetings would not start open session before 6.30. Oh, okay. Thank you, Ms. Mack. And um, looks like there's a comment from Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Were, were there other board members before me? No. I believe I was, Ms. Uh, Scott. Oh, I thought that was for an earlier comment. Let's see. I'm going back up. Yes, Ms. Jose, and then it looks like Ms. Hen, you had an additional comment, and then Ms. Causey. Go ahead, Ms. Jose. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to point out that as a working mom, um, 
it is extremely difficult for a working mom at five o'clock to be watching a committee meeting. That is not my priority. I have kids, we're running around for games. Uh, so I don't know what parents sits around watching a curriculum meeting at five. And besides, we have closed session that starts at five. So it's not feasible to have a committee meeting at five. That means I have to now devote the entire week to committee meetings. But committee meetings are recorded. I can watch it after the kids go to bed. The teachers can watch it at their convenience. So I don't really see the, this motion uh, helping the teachers. They can watch it at any time. I actually find it's an inconvenience for other board members um, that five o'clock is actually a very a stressful time for most working moms. And it is for me, and I speak from experience, and I, that's why I cannot attend a lot of five o'clock meetings that are held or during the day I watch them later. So I do not agree with this motion at all. And I hope that members of the board will not support this as a, you know, you always talk about empowering women. This actually does not empower women at all because it's now making me have every day have a committee meeting to go in. And um, it, it is very inequitable, this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Next is Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, to add, again, this motion is made in the interest of transparency. The public does like to watch our meetings live. I know that the recordings of committee meetings are available. However, I know many, many engaged community members who do watch them live. I've gotten complaints about times changing um, and, and board members who have been disenfranchised because committee chairs decide to arbitrarily change the times of the meetings with no regard for committee members' schedules. So there needs to be some consistency. I'd be open to an amendment if there's um, something that we can agree on across the board to bring some consistency and some respect for our public engagement and respect for board member engagement. Because currently decisions are being made to exclude board members and to silence board members from participating in committees that they otherwise would have participated in had the schedule been agreeable to all committee members. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I think that Ms. Hen and uh, other board members have made some very important points. And I think that uh, um, there are additional things that need to be discussed tonight, and I'm hoping that we do not move anything off this agenda because uh, my reopening uh, comments were um, precluded um, in terms, and I had concerns about special education uh, in our recovery. Uh, and excuse me, Ms. Causey, we're speaking addressed. to the motion. You're not speaking to the I motion. I am speaking to We've the motion. We've moved on from, I am from that. To the motion. So in that please keep I your comments to the motion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am keeping them to the to the motion. While I could make an amendment, as Ms. Hen is uh, stating that she would welcome an amendment, I think that this issue is uh, uh, <clears throat> needs more consideration than we can do at this meeting. Um, and I would um, request that Madam Chair put the issue of. Um, meeting times on the agenda. If it's an administrative issue and the uh, board council agrees that's administrative, it could be an administrative session or in open session. But I think the comments that have been made are stable, not changing things that are in print. And I agree with Ms. Mack. When I voted to support Ms. Rowe's amendment, I meant these meetings that started at 6.30 uh, are not gonna be changed in order for our public's expectations uh, and convenience to be adhered to. Um, and so <clears throat> while I'm not going to support this motion, I certainly support uh, the reasoning behind it that there needs to be uh, consistency, there needs to be stability, there needs to be uh, inclusion of uh, all committee members and, in, and all board members if there is any change that does have a reason that needs to be uh, accommodated on a case-by-case -case basis which we know during the pandemic, there are things that come up, um, but it should not be uh, just at one person's um, decision. Thank you, Ms. Causey. And um, I would just like to um, 
because uh, I just wanted to get some clarifying questions, because there were some things that were said as far as convenience to our viewing audience and convenience to stakeholders and teachers and things like that. I find meetings that are 10 o'clock at night, 1 o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock, highly inconvenient to working parents, to teachers, to our staff, to board members. So talk about convenience and making sure that we're inclusive and that everybody is included. How many people are able to watch a board meeting and, and, and stay on for hours at a time and be effectively engaged at 1 a.m. in the morning or right now even 1030 at night? A very serious motion that would have large impacts being made 1030 at night. So that, that's just, I think it's more likely that we would get more people involved and more viewership and, and more participation having it earlier. But so now that gets me to my other question, because uh, it was, I think words were thrown around saying that, you know, meetings have just been arbitrarily up and down, changed in and out. I would like to know government and affairs. Um, what time is government affairs? Has that time been changed? I believe, Ms. Pestor, is that what, four o'clock? Yes. And it hasn't been the same since? It's been the same. Okay, thank you. Curriculum. What time is curriculum? It's at 2.30, it's at and it was changed, but it was changed at the request of board of committee members. Committee members, okay. It's been this way about a year and a half. And it's been that way. Okay, PRC. I'm chair of PRC. PRC has not been changed. Equity has not been changed. The budget committee was just formed, and Ms. Hen set up the time for that. Mr. McMillian, what time is audit? 4.30, and I inherited that time. Okay, but it was not changed. Not, not my time. Okay, I, I'm just trying to say, because they're saying all these committee times have been changed, and right now I'm only seeing one committee time that has been changed, um, building and contracts. For the past several years, what time was building and contracts? Four. Four, okay, and it was changed. I presume this is, uh, it was changed to what time? It was changed to three or 3.30 based on the number of contracts we have, Ms. Scott. Sorry for... Um, yeah, okay. So then my question is, is that not something yeah. that board members on that committee could work out as opposed to imposing it on everyone? Thank you. Okay, so was there anybody else who... Yes. ...had a comment? Okay, let's see, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, was uh, Mr. Mohamza. Yes. Okay, sorry. Yeah, still one of my biggest concerns with this, um, and I, I've been hearing the conversation and a, a lot of good points have been brought up, but we keep saying that the public wants this, teachers want this without any poll being done. Um, and this is actually even the first time I've heard of this, that the public wants this, like this is the first time it's being brought up. Um, so I don't think we should, the board should uh, make vote on mo motions uh, and affirm those motions based on what one board member says. I mean, if. I would say that students want ice cream for board members every in the beginning of board meetings. Would you guys take me at my word? Probably not, because we have to th uh, think of this prudently and look at what's best. And what's best is what's working right now. And so I would move the mo uh, I would move the question. Second. The question has been moved by Mr. Mahomes. It was seconded by who? Molly Joes. Molly Joes. Okay. So if we could I, vote I on moving the question. I'd like to withdraw my motion. Oh, you're withdrawing and your motion? I'd like to withdraw the motion and instead discuss in administrative session. Okay. Thank you. So the motion has been withdrawn. Um, also, um, perhaps this is something we could also discuss at our retreat, because we do have a retreat coming up. So, um, okay. So then, if it has been withdrawn, we were back on our contracts and um, we were reviewing contract CWA-131-20 modification technical support to implement a community school strategy. Um, do I have a motion to approve item M2? So, so moved. Bro. Is there a second? Second, Causey. Oh, it needed. doesn't need a second. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. I knew he was going to come in. <laughs> All right. Um, could we do a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, and the next one is um, contract M3 ASI 813 21 musical instrument rental and repair services. Do I have a motion to approve item M1? So excuse moved. me, excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, item M3. So moved. So, mo <laughs> <laughs> so moved, Josh Momza. Thank you, Mr. Momza. Ms. Gover, could we do a roll call vote, please? Oh, I apologize. Excuse me. Um, was there a question, Ms. Mack, on um, the musical instrument rental and repair services, M3? In the interest of time, I have the same question on the next three. And my simple question is, the, these contracts state various schools and not all schools. And I want to know why not all schools. The, the mu musical instrument, the fresh bread and the fresh produce all reference various schools. These are intended to serve all schools. So I apologize if that language is not clear. Okay, all three contracts. Thank you. That's the, my yeah. only question then. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gover, could we do a roll call vote, please, on M3? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, M4 JBO 704 21 Security Officer Services. Do I have a motion to approve item M4? So moved, Ms. Pasteur. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Any questions? Okay, Ms. Causey has a question on M4. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I was reading the uh, uh, contract, uh, the author's, uh, excuse me, the authority summary sheet. <clears throat> it's called the recommendation form. And it was speaking to, and I also reviewed the answers, uh, questions and answers from Mr. Kuhn in um, that were included in board docs. The first question is, are Mr. Kuhn's questions and answers and any other board members' questions and answers uh, gonna be posted in board docs for the public? They are public. Ms. Okay, Gover, oh, sorry. She said they were and, in public, sorry. Okay, thank you. And what is the timing of that normally? Do we know the timing of when? Um, it, it, it varies when we get the question, how long it takes to answer the question, so. Did you hear Dr. Williams? He said it varies, like when they get the question, how long it takes to answer the question. Yes, thank you for that. And, wh and when is it attached? So is it attached to board docs as soon as it's available? This is Mr. Saris, and I asked that we not uh, because the information was shared with the board, I ask that, uh, as we have done with budget questions and other items in the past, that we post them uh, at the time of the meeting. Okay, so it's posted to the public at the time of the meeting. Correct. And the board members get it at the weekly update or sooner, as Dr. Williams said, if, if time allows. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. Um, the question I have related to the security... Um, officer services is it was concerning that the um, that one of the vendors that had been receiving the majority of um, our um, of the work last year is no longer in business so um, my one so one question is what are the length of times that these other vendors have been in business and uh, you know what are the recommendations? Do they include off-duty police officers? Um, and then my last question, which I'll just say now to get it out of the way, is uh, was it considered to give Baltimore County Police Department an opportunity to um, fulfill any of, of our needs in this area? Because we do have wonderful SROs and, um, you know, other community uh, policing partners um, that might be helpful. Thank so you. I I don't know how long the other companies have been in business, but our standard due diligence is to 
validate that they are uh, in good standing and have a demonstrated uh, uh, history of service and to check references and state tax uh, records. And uh, with regard to um, uh, county or other police officers, uh, my understanding is that that these uh, vendors do uh, do employ some law enforcement officers and that occasionally those officers will uh, arrange to work at events uh, with schools where they might serve as SROs or in some similar capacity. And I may have missed the third question, Ms. Causey, if you could repeat that. You're muted. You're muted, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Do any of the vendors utilize off-duty police officers? Would you yes, know that? They do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And are they? Um, okay. Thank you. That's all. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we did take a motion on this, correct? Okay. So if we could vote, please, Ms. Cover. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Ms. Causey. Yes. Ms. Mack. Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Ms. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next is item M5CWA-112-21, Fresh Bread. Do I have a motion? to approve item M5. So moved. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may we take a roll call vote, please, on item M5? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Pesture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And last, we have item M6ASI-812-21, Fresh Produce. Do I have a motion to approve item M6, Fresh Produce? So moved. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is board member comments and we'll just go around and with that. We'll start with Ms. Rowe. Yes, I just want to thank all of our teachers and staff and administrators um, for the hard work that they do and that they put in routinely. And, the, you know, this has been an extremely difficult year and we're coming to the end of this year. And I look forward to next year as a year that we can have a more normal school year. And, you know, sometimes the closer you get to the thing that you want, the harder it is to wait for that final stretch. And the more impatient people get and the more frayed nerves happen. And I think that we just need to remember that it's been a very long year. We don't really have much longer left to the really a better resolution to this pandemic and a, a better return to normal. And I just hope that we can keep our dignity and our composure for the remainder of this crisis. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Next, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. She, are you muted? Ms. Causey, are you there? 
Oh, okay. I'm there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm going to amend my uh, comments, um, but first I do want to acknowledge our teachers. Uh, there are not enough words to express my personal and also in my role as a board member, admiration and gratitude for our teachers and educators and, and all, all of the folks that just put it on the line for our children. Their heartfelt, courageous, and life-saving impact that they have on our children. I am encouraged that the superintendent made the announcement yesterday that we will have five days of in-person school for all students at all schools, and also that there will be a separate virtual program uh, with dedicated faculty and staff to that program, dedicated to those students and uh, their parents who commit to that program. Um, I am also hearing from all of our stakeholders across those many topics, um, and we need to do a better job as a board. We need to do a better job as a school system. And, uh, you know, this, this issue with the four-day in-person is still not settled uh, as there is still uncertainty in the minds of parents and students. And that is an issue that is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, at the central office level. And that still should be done, in my opinion. Uh, secondly, at the reopening, when that item got moved, I was going to address special education, compensatory education. Uh, we have heard significant concerns. Also, um, in evaluating the fall, uh, there has been, uh, I brought it up at the GT, the great, excuse me, Gifted and Talented Citizens Advisory Council meeting in February, uh, where Dr. Uh, Williams attended, as did Ms. Pester and Ms. Mack, uh, in talking about advancing students, especially 2E students. Um, and I would like Dr. Williams to have staff at the meeting next week where they're going to unveil additional uh, reopening plans for the fall uh, to discuss the semester schedule, the evaluation okay. of high schools. 18 out of 24 high schools chose the semester schedule. Okay, Ms. Clausey, that's time. Year, and so, there are uh, great benefits me. to it. Thank you. Okay, next is Ms. Mack. Um, yes, I would like to take the time to thank all the teachers who stepped up for our students, no matter what was thrown their way. I have heard countless stories about teachers who were on their own time, delivered supplies to students, drove house to house just to have socially distanced meet and greets, and who even researched and guided families to needed resources. My hat is truly off to each of you. I was dismayed that during a board meeting in April, we did not have enough votes to place academic achievement and academic outcomes on the agenda at as a standing agenda item. However, I am pleased that last month, Dr. Williams provided the board with a tentative list of topics specific to academic achievement and outcomes, and it w in which month each topic would be covered in a board meeting. Starting in July, I look forward to hearing about subjects like um, SAT, bridge plans, attendance, graduation rates, um, and as we heard tonight about extended year learning. Finally, at the inaugural meeting of the Budget Committee, members of the committee were provided with a summary of the county executive's changes to the FY22 operating budget. I am pleased that the county executive's proposal is 40.1 million or 4.7% over MOE. I was also pleased to find out that BCPS will receive $386 million in CARES 1 and 2 um, and American Rescue Act monies. I am hopeful that these monies will be used to fund the following, which were not included in the county executive's budget, but were encouraged in his budget message. 35 new positions, including counselors and PPWs, 122.3 enrollment-based teachers, adding 50 minutes to the school day, funding the expansion of the community eligibility program. We need our students to be well-nourished, and we need to ensure that our students are surrounded by the very people who can make the biggest difference in their lives, adequately compensated teachers and adequately compensated support personnel. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Next is Mr. McMillian. Believe it or not, I support all Baltimore County Public School employees, and I honestly don't know if I could have worked in a schoolhouse the last 14 months. I don't know. I just don't know that. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I do want to thank its Teacher Appreciation Week, and I want to thank all of the teachers. Uh, they've been in the front line of the pandemic, and um, 
been the challenge of virtual learning. So I want to uh, take a quick minute to thank all of our teachers and principal. And um, also, I want to uh, remind everybody that May is Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. This means we should uplift and celebrate everyone in the AAPI community that I'm a part of as well, East Asian, Pacific Islanders, South Asians, and multiracial Asians, and speak up against bigotry and hate crime against when we see and encounter those around us. And have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Next, Mr. Mahomza. Um, thank you for this wonderful meeting, uh, Madam Chair, and um, I want to thank um, all the teachers again for all the work they do. I also want to congratulate um, our Teacher of the uh, Year again, and just um, again wish everybody uh, a good week. Uh, but there is one other issue that I wanted to address um, that has been coming to light over the past couple of weeks about, um, and this was issues that I've been hearing from like the community that. Apparently, this position is considered um, part of the central office, and it's being dictated by central office. And I don't know if this has been addressed before, but let me address it now. My vote, how I vote, how I make my decision, is not determined by the superintendent, is not looked over by the superintendent, and any threats being made to me will not be tolerated. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Next is Mr. Offerman. Thanks to all the teachers and thanks to all the families that have had to endure what has been probably the hardest school year in the history of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Uh, next is Mr. Kuhn. I'm sorry, did Ms. Pasture leave? Yes, she did. <laughs> Oh, okay. well, thank you for checking I, I, on her. <laughs> I, I always follow Ms. Pasteur. She's tough to follow. So, okay, I'll try. I'll try to make up for her leaving. Um, I'll also thank uh, the teachers for the jobs that they've done. Um, the system wouldn't exist without you, so thank you, and, and you're appreciated. Uh, I just want to point out, I, I know that uh, there's a big uh, milestone for seniors. May 1st was selection date, so hopefully um, everybody uh, has made their decision and they're excited about uh, their next step. Um, uh, so congratulations to seniors. Um, also, I know that um, the spring season is underway. Uh, for the various sports teams across the system. Um, I hope that everybody's enjoying their time out on the field. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, we quickly start to follow the guidance of um, the governor and the county executive to allow uh, students uh, to, um, to not need masks outside overall. Um, and uh, happy May. May the 4th be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. I didn't actually prepare much to say, so I just wanted to echo what everyone else was saying uh, to our teachers. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week. Certainly echo Mr. Offerman in saying that it's been uh, absolutely the most challenging year I think anyone could ever imagine, and all the heroic efforts are just incredibly appreciated. Um, and then I also want to just repeat that I'm very excited to see our rates of COVID declining in our community. Keep up the good work, wear your masks, uh, do all the right things. And I'm so excited that the opportunity will likely be coming very soon for our younger adolescents to get vaccinated. Um, it just makes me feel very optimistic about uh, things moving forward and that I am hopeful uh, for the fall that things will feel pretty darn normal. So um, that is all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hager. And, um that's my turn. And um, I think I said everything I had to say in my video. And I just want to thank, again, all of our wonderful teachers who are doing a great job. Um, again, happy Teacher Appreciation Week. And I also would like to thank all of the board members who come here and who are um, uh, working hard um, so that we can um, do the best that we can and um, working with the superintendent and staff. So thank you. Okay, so the next item on the agenda are information items, which include the internal audit quarter three audit report per the request of the audit committee, community engagement and partnerships, and the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting minutes of March 15th, 20. 
21. And the next item on the agenda is consideration of agenda items for future board meetings, board members. Please note that items provided at past meetings have been received and are being reviewed. And we will start with Ms. Rao. Yes, so I would like to see on the agenda uh, some information on the, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act and how we're getting community members, parents, PTAs, teachers, everybody involved in the stakeholder input and participation in that. Thank you, Ms. Rao. Uh, next is Ms. Causey. Thank you. Um, I would like to see a uh, running list which had been created um, previously for all board members' agenda items and uh, to have a um, discussion about when those are going to be placed on the agendas. I also would like, uh, as I requested in my comments, um, for the semester schedule, which had been used by 18 out of 24 high schools this year, to be discussed as part of the reopening plan, uh, what evaluation has been done around uh, students and families and teachers and administrators, uh, what lessons can be learned from this year um, for the summer and also for the fall as we need, do need to recover and rebuild and to not uh, get stuck in the status quo as one of our um, advocates said in public comment, but to learn the lessons. And uh, one way to do that is to evaluate. We also heard from our uh, community um, and it's uh, discouraging that we had this wonderful report on uh, community engagement and it's an agenda item that does not have a single minute for uh, discussion. Um, so I'd like to see that as an item for discussion um, because there are good things that are happening, but there's also uh, a lot of improvement that needs to take place. Um, so, um, and I would also like to have on um, agenda the technical aspects um, that continue. I appreciate Dr. Scriven's report, um, but there are, <clears throat> excuse me, ongoing issues. Um, and I have other things that are out there. So hopefully I'll see them on a list. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Next is Ms. Mack. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for Dr. Williams for the update on when various academic achievement items will be brought to the full board for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? No, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Jones? Ms. Jones? Mr. Mahomza? Okay. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, academic achievement is the top thing that I'd like to speak further about. Uh, not far behind that, um, there's a specific contract that we have. It's a 20-year energy savings performance contract. Um, and I believe that um, we should discuss it either in building in contracts uh, or uh, in the full board because it's 20 years long and it's specific and expensive. So I think that's of interest. Uh, the, the last topic I would like to talk about um, that I'll mention tonight is uh, the, the money that we're spending on vehicles and moving to hybrid and or electric options, um, if that's feasible and makes sense. I know that there are other, uh, other school systems that are doing that. And I think the time is right for us to take a very close look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Dr. Hager? 
Um, I have two things. Um, one was spurred by one of the public comments that was made around school meals. Um, I think it would be really helpful to hear um, what the summer feeding program is and how it's different from the National School Lunch Program, because that is the model that's being used right now to feed kids during school, and every kid, every kid gets a free meal right now. Um, and again, the meal patterns are different. And so just so folks know that this is not typ a typical school meal, but it, it does meet very specific standards. And so if, um, if Karen or someone from Food Nutrition Services could uh, potentially inform people um, about what is happening happening with, with school meals during the pandemic and what's anticipated in the fall um, and, and the summer as well, because she, she's also in charge of that. So uh, maybe a little, a little short presentation on that would be great. And then the second thing is um, high school start time, I know has been an ongoing discussion. And I think that when um, kids were learning virtually, they got to sleep in a little bit and uh, there may have been some pr pretty important benefits to that for a lot of kids. And then transitioning back to the typical high school start time was um, a bit of a shock to a lot of kids' systems. And I do wonder what degree that um, itself plays as a barrier to returning to in-person education for a lot of kids. Um, and so uh, given that, and we know that there's a lot of science behind circadian rhythms that are not in line with early start times for high school students, um, this might be a prime time to really dig in a little bit more um, on that in Baltimore County. And I believe that there's been stuff in the past about it. So I just would like to know more about what you guys have discussed before and um, whether this is an option potentially moving forward. Thank you. And um, next is me. And I think for me, I would um, like to see some updates on our teacher recruitment, the presentation that you all did, um, some updates on um, how that's going, the level of responses that we've received, and um, the direction um, that we're going in. It would be nice to have another report on that. So thank you, everyone. The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next hybrid meeting will be held on Tuesday, May 18th, 2021. The board's public hearing on the fiscal year 2023 capital budget will be held on Wednesday, May 19th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. So thank you for joining us tonight, and the meeting is now adjourned.